Welcome to Classic Trials. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC, and on this channel, we make sense of the law one bite at a time. In this series, we observe and analyze the play-by-play -play of some of the biggest trials that have shaped the public consciousness of the American judicial system. In this season, we're working our way through the case of California v. Eric and Lyle Menendez. Growing up in Princeton, New Jersey, and then Beverly Hills, California, these young men had everything they could ever want, or so it seemed, until one night on August 20th, 1989, they approached Jose and Kitty Menendez with newly purchased shotguns. Put on trial for murdering their own parents, they claimed self-defense, arguing they were terrorized in their own home by abusive parents until they could take no more. Which argument is more convincing? Come join and see for yourself. Hello, hello. Uh, speaking of terrorizing homes, <laughs> uh, here's Mavi, and she is terrorizing my office right now. Go over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh happy new year everybody i hope you're having a wonderful wonderful january wonderful 2024 i hope it's off to a good start and if not hey we can always we can always have a stumbling start and uh you know and then and then kind of roll into things a little bit better oh my goodness you are in such a zoomy playful mood right now you are going to be like this the entire time aren't you <laughs> Um, anyhow, so for, for me, me and Mr. Bites, we had a great, a great new year's. Um, we went to a party. It was great. There was lots of dancing. I heard the Macarena for the first time, for the first time in like, I don't know, 20 years, maybe it feels like, I mean, I haven't heard the Macarena in such a long time. Um, and they played it on the dance floor and I couldn't help myself. We had to dance. Oh my goodness. What are you doing? Seriously, you are such a dog. I'm telling you, she's a terror right now. <laughs> okay, maybe go that way. Go that way. Go on. <laughs> uh, anyhow, so I hope you guys had a great New Year's as well. As you can tell, Indy is all partied out. <laughs> so she's being a total snoozer 10 right now. We'll see. Maybe she'll see Mavi playing around and decide that she is annoyed of it and wants to have nothing with nothing to do with it. <laughs> so anyhow, um, also, uh, Shireen, thank you so much for gifting one legal bites membership. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I love the fact that folks like to, to gift memberships. Um, and, uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Very kind and generous of you. And who was it that was gifted? When can I see? Oh, flash fan 85 was gifted a membership. Great. Awesome. 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 Welcome back to bike club flash fan 85. Um, and also let's see if this shows up too. Yes, it does. Emily Aaron's member for six months made it to pizza level. Awesome. You made it to pizza. I love it. Love to see it. Love to see it. Um, so anyhow, yes. Yeah, so, so we are now at the first episode for 2024. We're jumping right back into it as, as usual. This is episode 52 in our series of the Menendez trial. Obviously for anybody that is new here, um, I recommend starting from the beginning first off, um, cause we are definitely well into the trial at this point. Um, but this is now we we spent a long time going through Eric Menendez's testimony uh, right before that was Lyle. So that was also long, but Eric's was even longer. And so it kind of it kind of feels good to to be out of those woods at this point and to be hearing from other witnesses. Now, today we're, we're going to hear I mean, I'm, I've got I got so used to this is part X, Y, Z of Eric's testimony or Lyle's testimony that now it's, it's, I feel like it's going to feel a lot faster going through six witnesses in one, in one episode. It'll be a, a bit of a longer episode. The, the, the amount of testimony is like three and a half hours. And then of course I like to pause and talk. And when people have questions, I, I like to answer them, you know, and I pause that to, to do that. Um, so, you know, it'll probably, probably be a longer episode, but it'll be interesting. One person that, that we will be hearing from who I'm very, very interested in, in hearing the testimony because I've heard so much about it is Andy Kano, uh, or Kano, sorry. Um, um, Andres Kano, he goes by Andy, um, the cousin, Eric's cousin that he apparently told him about, the abuse, the, the, the worst, the SA, that abuse. Um, so this is going to be very, very interesting to see, um, 
what 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 comes out in his testimony. But we're also going to hear from his mother again. So Aunt Marta, we're going to hear from her again. Um, we've we've seen her a couple times before this point, so it'll be interesting to see what what else she testifies to. Uh, and then we'll we'll be seeing you know some other folks like Donovan Goudreau. We're going to see him again. Um, the defense calls him as well. So there's there's going to be some some interesting interesting testimony today. Um, I think I think that's about it. Uh, let's see. Has O one member for 16 months. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Has O one. Good to see you here. And thanks thanks again for being a member for 16 months. Love it. Love it. Uh, <laughs> and Robbie Dobby. But will we see the return of Paisley and mustaches? Probably. Probably in in Menendez Land, it is still 1993. So I I would venture to guess that yes, we will we will probably be seeing a bit of that uh, once again. So anyway, so to all the folks who are who are watching, whether you are watching live and you're in the chat or you're live and lurking, uh, or to the folks that are watching on replay, Happy New Year, welcome back, and uh, happy to uh, to to continue with this series with all of you. All righty. Let's, ah, here's a question before we, before we get started. Isn't Andy the one Eric wrote that sad letter to? Yes. Yes. He is, he is, he is the, the cousin to whom he wrote that letter. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I don't think that letter comes up in the testimony. I think that was something that was found much later in among his possessions. Um, because t- tragically he he died i think in recent years um so uh yeah but i i i would venture to guess he's probably going to be testifying to similar stuff to, that that he uh that eric told him about in the letter as well so already um oh and nico kiski what letter this was th- there was a letter that was found recently um, among Andy Cano's things, it was like in storage or something that they, they didn't, they, they had, I guess, forgotten about it or Eric had forgotten about it. It was a letter that Eric had written to Andy and basically talking about the abuse and saying it's happening again and it's worse than it was before, essentially. Like that was the gist of it. And so when, when this was recently found, um, this was added to a habeas petition to try once again to, to get the guys, uh, get their, either their sentence reduced or to get a new, new trial, um, for them. Like this was like the, within the last year. So, um, that's what that, what that was. So, um, oh, I see Audrey. He died. So apparently he died in 2003. Okay. I thought it was a bit more recent, but I guess they just, they just found this stuff going, going through his stuff recently, um, was my understanding, even if he died quite a while ago. Bummer. Written in 1988. Okay. Says Rocky is here. Interesting. Interesting. All righty. Okay. Let's continue on with our testimony then. And, and we'll, I'll be updating in the chat as well. Um, who's, who's testifying, uh, and it's all for the defense. These are, these are all people being called, called by the defense. So if you have any questions about that, it's, it's going to be pinned in the chat. All right. Let's let's continue on, shall we? Happy New Year, Sandy. Thanks for being a member for 16 months. And also a wonderful mod. And also, I didn't say that earlier about Shireen when she gifted memberships. Thank you also for being a fantastic mod. We have some really great mods here. So... So round of applause for the mods as always. I know they're they're not always able to all be here at the same time, but I I I always appreciate all of their efforts and and helping to sort of guide our community, you know, um what is it? Our 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 community culture, <laughs> right? Where people can agree or disagree and and do so in a way that is, you know, that is that is constructive, right? So we can all arrive at the the truth of the capital T. All right, anyway, can let's let's and also I probably should Bring the testimony to the front, right? Pull it on the screen. <laughs> okay. All right. You take the stand and see the name of your Donovan Goudreau. G O O T R E A U. 
Mr. Boudreau, you were here. Wait, hold on a second. We have one juror who's. Um... <laughs> Okay. okay. All right, let's proceed. Okay. Mr. Goudreau, you were here in court on July 26, 1993, as a prosecution witness. Do you recall that? Yes. And at that time, I believe that you told us about your friendship with Lyle Menendez. Do you remember? Yes. And I asked you if there was a conversation which took place in a Chinese restaurant. Yes. Do you remember? And did such co a conversation take place? Yes. Was that in May of 1989, approximately? Late April, early May. Okay. And can you tell me what the what the the mood was of this uh, conversation in the Chinese restaurant? <coughs> what was going on? Um, I had known Lyle for several months up to that point, and uh, we had spent a lot of time together, bonded as friends, and got to know each other very well. It came towards the end of the school year. We were both making plans for the summer future plans together. We decided to have dinner somewhere off of Palmer Square, some Chinese food place. It was late at night. Um, we at, <coughs> let me ask a question. At the time that you were having the conversation, were there a lot of people in the restaurant? Or was it? I think when we first went in, it was clearing out. It was late at night. And then as the night went on as dinner finished. I think it was empty with only the staff waiting for us to land. Okay. And were the chairs put up on the table? Um, that yeah, I think, I think actually the chairs were on the table. Okay. And what type of conversation were you and Lyle Menendez having at that time? <laughs> I forget how it started, but it was along the lines of, you know, we know everything about each other and, um, Lyle asked if there was anything about me he didn't know. And uh, I mentioned that uh, I was abused. Now, you mentioned this in sort of an offhand way now. Was that a, a very big thing for you to reveal at the time? I had never told anybody that I was abused. Now, why were you telling Lyle, Lyle Menendez at this time? Well, I felt really close to him. And then I felt like, you know, he showed an interest in me and, wanted to know everything about me and and also I felt the time was right for me to tell someone. Okay. And how did you feel in talking about your own abuse? It wasn't easy. I didn't think it was going to be. Okay. Um by the way, this being 1993, honestly how much courage does it take to not only have the conversation in May 1989 with Lyle, but then also to openly testify in this case at this point in the trial. No doubt there already has been a ton of media about the abuse. And I don't know when SNL aired their skits on it, but like I, I can just imagine that him going in, if he's been paying any attention to what's been going on around this trial, him going in and and being willing to talk about it like this is is like that takes a lot. That takes a lot of courage. I'm. I just want to point that out <laughs> uh, before we before we we continue on. Um, yeah. Anyway. And what did you tell him had happened to you? Um. Objection hearsay. All right. It's not being offered for the truth of what is said, just to uh, reflect the conversation. You may proceed. And also, Shireen, thank you so much for the trigger warning. This testimony involves details of abuse. We understand that it can be distressing for some. Please get help or step away if you need to. Yeah, if, if any of this is, if you're having a hard time with any of this at any point in time, please do take care of yourself. Do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. That is most important. None of this content, testimony, any of it, this trial, none of it is worth it. Take care of yourself. Um, and um, at some point, mods often also post uh, uh, um, 
uh, helplines. So if those if those pop up in the chat, I'll put I'll pull those up on the screen as well from time to time. So general trigger warning for all of this. So obviously we're going to be hearing at least a little bit about it here as as he's already talking about it. All right. I can't remember word for word, but it was something along the lines that I was abused when I was very young and that uh, it kind of changed the course of my life. Kind of. Did you tell him who had abused you? I can't recall if I did or not. Who was it that had abused you? It's a friend of my father's. A male or a female? Male. And were you emotional in describing this to Lyle? The memory is somewhat blurred, but I do remember, I think, leaving the table, not being able to uh, control my emotions. And how did Lyle respond to this? Um, he was uh, hes pretty quiet. He was a great listener. And uh, anything pertaining to me or something of this, he was just was very quiet, gave me all the time I needed to answer the question, you know, to, and uh, seemed somewhat uh, emotional about it. Why do you say he seemed emotional about it? I can't remember exactly why, but I just know that he reacted strongly towards me saying that. It wasn't, I would have remembered if he would have, like, changed the subject or, you know, you know, looked like he was not believing me. Do you remember saying that he, that Lyle seemed very shaken? I don't remember saying that, but if I, that's, that's a pretty good response. And do you remember saying that uh, tears were welling in his eyes, in yeah. Lyle's eyes? <laughs> Overall. Do you remember saying that tears were welling in Lyle's eyes? Um, yes, I do. Um, what did you think about the way he reacted to this information you were giving him? Um, well, that's, a, that's a tough question because uh, we had known each other for so long and we both knew about each other's fathers and our both our fathers are very oppressive and uh, since the very first night we met we talked about how hard they were pushing us and and how much of a driving force they were in our lives and so at the time maybe through some intuition i might have thought that you know he was reacting either kindly to me because of my past or whether he was you know feeling the same way himself do you remember saying that you were shocked at how emotional he was? I don't remember saying that, but it, that sounds like something I would have said. Okay. Were you shocked at how emotional he was? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. You never know what to expect when you tell someone something like that. And did that cause you to believe that something similar may have happened <laughs> to Lyle? Absolutely. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Yeah, she's kind of leading. Uh, what did that cause you to believe? This, uh, yeah, uh, leading objection. She's she definitely has gotten away with quite a bit in in leading this conversation so far, but 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 I mean, as as we've gone over many times in this trial and in other other trials as well, sometimes <laughs> it doesn't really matter because if the so long as the witness is paying attention, then they know exactly where you want to go anyway. So you just you just you know ask it in a more open way that is that is you know allowed under the rules of evidence <laughs> and then uh, and then you still get the answer anyway that he may have had similar experiences okay. and did he say anything to you about having had a similar experience not that i recall no did he say anything to you about his father having molested both him and his brother no i would have remembered that you would remember that if he did that. Oh, absolutely. Is that correct? Did you ever tell anyone else that Lyle had told you that he had been molested by his father and his brother had also? Um, obviously, I heard the tape, so I know that I may have mentioned it later on. Okay. And to whom did you mention it? Bob Rand. 
Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to play the tape. I'd like to mark as our next exhibit um, a tape, which is 293, and a transcript as 294. Those exhibits will be marked. Okay. And by the way, real quick, let me get um, a few member chats here as well. I missed this one earlier from Shireen, member for 15 months. Happy to be, be happy to be back with you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shireen. And thanks for being a member for 15 months. And of course, for being a fantastic mod. Flashfan85, member for five months. Thanks so much for being a member for five months, Flashfan. Uh, hi, Alita. Happy New Year. Hope this year is wonderful and awesome for you. You are the best law tuber out there. You are a friend that we all love. Thank you so much. That is so kind of you to say. Um, and Happy New Year to you, too. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful 2024. Uh, Mountain Princess 207, member for 13 months. Hi, friends, with some waving emojis. Hey, Mountain Princess 207, good to see you. And thanks so much for being a member for 13, 13 whole months. That's a long time. Uh, I appreciate all of you guys for, for supporting the channel in various ways, whether you are a member of the channel or you are just a regular watcher, liking the streams, commenting on, on these videos, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all right, let's continue on. <laughs> There's going to be an audio tape that we get to hear, I suppose. Your Honor, may I approach and play the tape? Uh, let's get the uh, transcripts distributed first here. I wish we could get a transcript. <laughs> All right, uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Do you remember when you testified in uh, July 26th, on July 26th, 1993, as a prosecution witness, um, you said that you had never told anybody uh, that Lyle Menendez had made the statement to you? Yes. You remember that? So I take it you were mistaken at that time. Is that correct? Obviously. Oh, no, it's one of the – I don't know why I always forget, but the audio, like when they play audio tapes in here, it's out of a boom box. It's not even – oh, God, this is going to suck. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what to call on that, but uh, I know that I want to kind of scared that's going to come up in trial. I will. Yeah. That's it. I will. No, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know that, but it's – yeah. You know, but well, I remember. I had to remember how, how, how did it? How did that conversation start? We were at a Chinese food restaurant towards the end of early May, and uh, this I think it's before he uh, found out about my lies. And he said that it was it was probably like, let's go have Chinese food tonight. We're best friends. And we sat there and he said, I know everything about you. You know, you're my best friend. I love you. You know what I think it might have been? Because I think it might have been, he found out a little bit about me, but he didn't believe it. He didn't want to believe it. He wanted to come back to me and see if I would tell him the truth. Why are they testing you? He was testing me. But still, at the same time, it was 100%. He would be, you couldn't, it was real. You couldn't fake the kind of emotion he was giving me right then. And we're sitting there, and he says, yeah, I know everything about you, my best friend. I love you as much as my brother, if not more. He said, you know, we're family. As far as I see from here, I'm family. They're my two greatest concerns are my mom and my brother. And uh, 
I try to help them as much as I can. I, I worry if anything happens to me, if they're going to be okay. He takes care of his brother. He just looks out for his brother. It's the biggest concern. And he said, uh, you know, if anything happens to me, uh, I need you to help take care of my brother for me. And uh, if anything happens you know, to you, I'll take care of your mom and brother for me. These kind of things are said back and forth across the table. And I want to be, be together for him. Anything can come between us, anybody, any girl, anything, just us. And he says, you know, is there, is there anything I don't know about you? And I said, you know, as a matter of fact, there is. You know, when I was a kid, I was told I was molested. And in front of my father's, we were spending the weekend at a uh, business friend's house. And telling the story, I'm all choked up because I can't believe I've never, I've never told anyone the yeah, story. And that was really personal. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, he was in tears. Was 20 minutes in speed. And I'm telling him this whole story about, I can still remember pictures on the wall and the color of the room and the carpet and, and uh, time it was and, you know everything about it it's very clear in my mind and just bring it all back up and I have to choke that back excuse myself to the bath and just wipe the tears off of it. I came back and he told me about his father and, and I I guess maybe one of the reasons we were friends is because we had so much in common with this yeah, we did the club. Club. Where we suffered, you know, experience, and then, and then to, to bring this into the relationship as far as um, an experience we both shared that we've never spoken to or about to anybody. So basically, he said that his father had been abused in Eric. Yeah, him and Eric. And uh, a lot of loss. Yeah, and uh, we take baths and stuff. Just. Just, you're at this. It's weird because he felt we were we weren't drinking. We were just sitting there eating, and pulled this pull the chairs are up on the table. You guys just know the way for some reason. He's telling this. I could have fallen on the back of my seat. He's telling me that um, him and his brother and uh, his brother has been the most affected by it. He's still he was younger, more impressionable. It was, that was a lot clearer than I thought it was going to be. That was the, probably the clearest audio we've heard yet. <laughs> Mr. Do you recognize your voice? Yes. And who's the other voice on the tape? Bob Rand. And was that an interview you had with him in March of 1992? I can't recall when I did the interview. You talked to Mr. Rand on several occasions, is that correct? Yes. And you were, were interviewed by several other reporters, is that correct? Yes. And having listened to the tape now, uh, does that refresh your recollection? Of the events? Yes. No, I heard the tape last time, and it doesn't help me. I know that I said that, but I just can't recall all the events surrounding it. Okay. Well... Do you think when you told Mr. Rand that in March of 1992, you were telling him the truth? I, I really can't recall why I would have said that, whether it was truth or not. And you mean you might have just made that up? It's possible with knowing Glenn Stevens and uh, Bob Rand that I may have put that together. I'm not sure how I came to that. And conclusion. how is knowing Glenn Stevens and Bob Rand, um, how would that have created the situation? Well, unlike L.A., New York, something along the lines of this trial goes somewhat unnoticed. And uh, there was an anonymity there. And a lot of, I didn't know a lot about the trial, only what maybe Glenn Stevens, who I had contact with, and Bob Rand may have told me over a period of years. And now, do, is it your testimony that Bob Rand told you that Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father? Oh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not sure where I heard it. Okay. I can't say who I heard it from. Is it your testimony that Glenn Stevens told you that Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father? It may have been him. It may have been Bob Rand. Do you remember uh, saying that you were very surprised when you met with Glenn Stevens after this interview with Bob Rand, and he seemed to know about Lyle and Eric having been molested? Objection. A satisfaction on evidence. 
No. Let me go back, if I may, Your Honor. Right. Um, you were interviewed by reporters for the Los Angeles Times Magazine at one point. Is that correct? Yes. And you then went to Princeton to have your picture taken there as part of the article that they were publishing with regard to this case. Is that correct? Yes. And when you went to Princeton to be photographed, you ran into Glenn Stevens. Is that correct? Yes. And do you remember telling Bob Rand that you were so surprised when you ran into Glenn Stevens because he also seemed to know that Lyle and Eric had been molested? I don't remember saying that. I remember talking to him and I don't remember anything about that. If I showed you a transcript of that part of the tape with Bob Rand, would that refresh your recollection? No. No, because this obviously didn't, so I can't say that that would. So if you had told Bob Rand that that this was the first time that you'd seen Glenn since you were thrown out of uh, the dorm room in Princeton and that you were so surprised because Glenn said, did you know about the molestation? And you told Bob Rand that you were surprised that Glenn also knew. Objection. Do you remember saying something like that to Bob Rand? Objection calls for hearsay lack of foundation. No, I'm just asking if he remembers saying that. Objection sustained the, the question. Do you remember telling Bob Rand <laughs> that when Glenn Stevens told you he knew about the molestation, you were surprised because you already knew it? No. Objection lack of foundation with respect to No, I don't. Aaron, if I could have him. This is interesting because uh, the defense is really trying to push him on, on, hey, like, where did, where, where did you find out that Lyle was abused? Was it in this conversation in the Chinese restaurant? The defense obviously would love for him to say, yes, I now remember that in the Chinese restaurant, that was where Lyle told me about this because that would tend to corroborate the claims about them having been abused as kids, right? Because the prosecution wants to say, no, 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 they're making this all up. This is all just a, just a, a, a last ditch effort to try to save themselves um, and save their lives because capital punishment is on the line. Um, but now we've got this, this conversation that he had with Bob Rand, where he was also talking about the, the conversation that he had with Lyle in the Chinese restaurant back in May, 1989. So the question is, you know, where, where, at what point and, and where did he learn who, from whom did, did Donovan Gaudreau learn about the SA? I don't know. Um, I mean, it seems, it seems reasonably likely that, that something like that would have come up in the Chinese restaurant. If Donovan says that he told, this was where, where he revealed to, to Lyle that he had been through something similar. Um, because oftentimes, you know, like that's where something like that has a tendency to to come out if if somebody is 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 holding that in. But now he's saying he doesn't he really doesn't remember if he had told him that then or if he learned from Bob Rand or if he learned from from uh from Glenn Stevens. Um so this is very very interesting. Um and and it's interesting so I I wanted to to put the poll. So far it's looking pretty over I I so the for folks, if you can't see the chat, the poll says, is Donovan Gaudreau being honest about not remembering or is he hiding something? So far, it's pretty overwhelmingly people think that he's hiding something. 24% uh, think he's being honest. 70, uh, well, 23%, 77% say hiding something. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, this is this is very, very interesting to me. Let's let's continue walk, uh, watching. I have a minute. I have the remainder of the tape, and I can play that part for Mr. Gaudreau. Mr. Gaudreau, rather than take the time to find on the tape this particular section, I'm going to read you a transcript of what's on the tape and see if you remember saying that. And I believe it would be a stipulation that this is a transcript of the tape, although it may not be 100% accurate. We're going to admit the tape. Is that correct? Yes, there would be a stipulation that this is a somewhat accurate transcript. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Goudreau, on the tape, it says basically this. The first time I'd seen Glenn, and you're referring to this incident where you had your photograph taken. Do you remember that? 
Yes. He said, we were walking over in front of Chuck's, and he all of a sudden was walking out of Chuck's. All of a sudden walking out of Chuck's was Glenn and this girl. And he looks up, and he goes, hey, hey. Do you remember that happening? I don't remember what he said, but I remember seeing him walking out of Chuck's. Okay. But of course, there was a smile on his face, and he was immediately elated. We shook hands, and this photographer got a picture of us together. Is that correct? Did that happen? I don't remember shaking hands. I do mean, remember him being happy to see me. And do you remember being photographed? Um, I remember the photograph. But I don't remember the picture actually being taken. Okay. Then you say it was the picture in the Los Angeles Time magazine. Is that the photograph you're referring to? Yes. And we were in there, and the guy wanted to go. So I told him I would just take the train back to town. Did you take the train back to town? I must have. Okay. <coughs> and when the photographer, and then there's a part of the tape we can't hear, then the sentence goes on, Glenn and myself stayed there. Did you stay and talk to Glenn after your photo was taken? Yes, I did. Okay. And Glenn just freaked me out because I thought Lyle, I thought I was the only one who'd heard about that or knew about that. And all of a sudden, Glenn told me the same thing. He said, did you know about the molestation and all that? Do you remember that? No. You remember telling Mr. Rand that? Not, not clearly, no. Okay. But if your voice is on the tape, Obviously, sure. then it would have been something you said. Is that correct? Sure. And he brought it up again. And I'd almost forgotten about it, and he brought it up again, and I just couldn't believe it. I said, really? I said, I didn't know about that, and it was kind of strange for him to tell me, because I was wondering under what circumstances he would tell Glenn. Now, that's referring to Lyle telling Glenn, is that correct? Yes. Did it seem surprising to you that Glenn would have been told by Lyle? There's some holes of speculation there, and irrelevant. Sustained. Did you think that the relationship that Lyle had with you was much closer than the relationship he had with Glenn? That's Overall. I wasn't sure because I hadn't seen either one of them in a long time. But at the time that you were all at Princeton together, was your relationship with Lyle much closer than oh, Lyle's with Glenn? And then the tape goes on to say, and you know, I thought he was having problems, you know, Lyle was scared, too. The house at Calabasas had this huge bathtub, and he was, like, fearing this thing. Do you remember saying anything about a bathtub? No. But if your voice is on the tape, you would have been the one to say it. Is that correct? Yes. To, like, God's end, they didn't like the house at all. Yeah, so I remember Glenn told me that later, that kind of brought it back up, that made me think about the whole hatred thing and about how he hated his father. And he told me, and then Mr. Rand's voice comes on and says he would go on and on about how much he respected his father. And the tape goes on from there. Do you remember having that conversation with Mr. Rand? No. What is your... What is your position with regard to where you got the information about Lyle and Eric having been molested by their father? Do you know where that information came from? After uh, I testified last time, I thought a lot about it, and the only people I was in contact with were Bob Rand and Glenn Stevens. And yet this part of the tape seems to indicate that you already knew about it, about the molestation when Glenn revealed it. Is that correct? Yes, it, it sounds that way. Okay. So if you already knew about it when Glenn brought it up, then Glenn would not have been the source of the information. Is that correct? I have no idea. Overall, the answer is dead. And do you, is it, what's your testimony with regard to Mr. Rand? Did he tell you? Tell me. That Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father, or did you tell him? I have no idea. 
Well, when you listen, well, obviously I told him, but it seems like there was a couple of places where he seemed to be leading me, and I'm unclear about whether I might have come under that assumption myself or been. Well, when you say there's a couple of places where he seems to be leading you, um, he says to you at the beginning of the tape, we didn't mention yesterday you got off on, and then there's a part of the tape we can't hear, where he had at one point mentioned that Eric was being abused sexually. And you said, yeah, I don't want to go off into that. I know I'm scared it's going to come up at trial. And Mr. Rand says, well, how did that conversation start? And then you proceed to tell the entire story of the Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And during the time you're telling that story, Mr. Rand is not supplying you any information. Is that correct? Objection. As soon as fact, not evidence, call for conclusion. Oh. Um, can you repeat the question? Yes. During the time that you are telling Mr. Rand the story mm -hmm. of your conversation in the Chinese restaurant, it's just you talking. Isn't that correct? No, I'm, I'm aware of that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And at the end, Mr. Rand says, so basically his father had been Mo, and that's the end of that. And you interrupt and you say, yes. Mr. Rand says, abusing Eric. And you say, yeah, him and Eric. And Mr. Rand says, both Lyle also? And you say yes. Is that correct? Yes. So are you suggesting that Mr. Rand gave you this information? I already answered that earlier. I have no idea where I may have come up with that. So you're not saying Mr. Rand gave you that information? I'm not sure if he did or not. And you're not saying Glenn Stevens gave you that information? He may have also. I'm not sure. But then how would you have said that you were surprised that Glenn knew it when you already knew it? If the information came from Glenn. I don't remember saying I was surprised. The, yeah, I'm not going to lie. This does feel like he's obfuscating a little bit. Also, I apologize for the quality of the video right now. I just remembered I am. Hang on. Let me let me switch over to Ethernet real quick or let me try. If I lose you guys, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Uh, just give me, give me one second. Hopefully, hopefully this works. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Are we good? Oh, and also I need to do that. Are we, are we good? Are we live? We still running? Let me just see here real quick. Okay, looks like it. Okay, great. All right, good, good, good. Okay, sorry about that little delay there. Um, yeah, it does feel like he's obfuscating a bit to me here because especially after Jill Lansing worked him through the progression of like, okay, so let's talk about, you know, when you met with, uh, uh, with Glenn Stevens. So, you know, this is, this is what happened. This is, you know, what, what was said in the conversation. So it seems like you both already knew prior to this conversation, right? Yes. Okay. So then, you know, in the conversation with Bob Rand, blah, 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 blah. Like it just, it just seems like she's working him through very logically through both of these conversations. And then he's, he's still coming back in a way that doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to have a decent explanation for why he, why he still is kind of pointing back to both of those conversations as like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But one of them probably told me about this or like one of them may have told me about this. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel like he's being totally open and totally honest. It does feel like he's 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 holding something back here. Um that's that's my impression. Folks might disagree with that. Uh Debbie Faze on Cook, thanks so much for being a member for 13 months and a one another one of our wonderful mods. Happy New Year, my friends. Love y'all. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um and, uh, and likewise, happy new year to you too. I hope it was wonderful. And thanks so much for joining us once again in the new year in this wonderful series that we've got going on. 
Okay. Uh, and also, here's a question right here. Flash Fan 85, can the defense call a prosecution witness? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and and the prosecution can call defense witnesses as well. So the, the prosecution could have, in their case in chief, called the defendants. Obviously, they can decide to take the fifth. But... Um, but yeah, you can, you can always call an opposing witness. So if somebody who, who is favorable to the other side, there's a, a different way that you might, uh, conduct that direct examination. But, um, but yeah, hundred percent. All right. Let's, let's continue with this testimony, but this is, this is definitely very, very, very interesting right here. And I'm going to, I know end, you read the transcript the and I did remember, I do remember hearing that, mm -hmm. but I still can't remember. So if your voice is on the tape saying that, though, that would have been something you said. Yes. Do you have any other sources, possible sources, for where that information would have come from? In New York City, the, the media didn't really cover the trial mm -hmm. or any aspects of it. Uh, do you remember testifying, and Your Honor, at this time I'm reading from volume 55, July 27th, 1993, page 7994, starting at line 9. Question is, the other thing you said was you got information about the case from Mr. Wren and Mr. Stevens. Answer, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're the only two people I had contact with. Question, and did you ever have any conversations with Mr. Stevens about whether Lyle or Eric abused their parents? Your answer was, were abused by their parents. Your answer was no. And then my question was, so the information couldn't have come from Mr. Stevens, is that correct? Your answer was, I'm not saying, I don't know where the information came from. I obviously said it. And then there is, then you are asked on page 7995, question, and do you remember have any, having any conversations with him, meaning Mr. Stevens, with regard to whether there was any sexual abuse in the family? You answered no. Is that correct? What page comes from? Sorry. That was 7995, line 17. Could you repeat that question? Yes. You were asked, do you remember having any conversations with him, meaning Mr. Stevens, on that occasion, which was the time you had the picture taken, with regard to whether there was any sexual abuse in the family? Your answer was no, you didn't remember any such conversation. Do you remember testifying to that under oath? Yes. And yet your voice is on the tape indicating you had such a conversation. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah, this is this is definitely definitely very interesting. I the impression that I have right now is that he may have initially started out wanting to be, you know, open and cooperative and helpful and all that and then got spooked because of how much was around the trial. Like he he said he said that he, you know, he's I guess he's on the East Coast, I think he said. Um and so he like there wasn't much about the trial that was being sort of publicized over there, but you know, in LA there's, there's so much about it, but I, I would, I don't know. I would not be surprised if he got spooked because of how much attention this trial was getting and particularly on this kind of stuff. Um, and if he himself was, is, a, is a, uh, an SA survivor from, you know, his childhood I, I I could imagine that there's all kinds. I'm not making excuses for him, but I'm just saying I'm I I think I can understand how someone could get spooked coming from his his position. Um. So anyway, yeah. And then later on, page seventy nine ninety six at line twenty seven. I asked you, and at that time, at the time that you and Mr. Stevens were photographed together, did you have any conversation at that time as to whether Lyle and Eric 
whether, I'm sorry, whether Lyle had ever revealed to either of you anything about the abuse in his family, the sexual abuse of either him or of Eric. And you then say, I can't remember if we did or not. So is it fair to say that you don't remember? Yes. But you do remember for sure the conversation in the Chinese restaurant. Is that correct? Um, parts of it, yes. And you do remember for sure that you revealed your own abuse? Yes. And you do remember for sure Lyle's very strong emotional reaction to that? Yes. And you do remember for sure that you assumed based on his reaction that the same thing had happened to him? Yes. You just are not sure about the words? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any examination on behalf of Eric Menendez? Cross-exam. No, no. Cross-examination. Oh, okay. Mr. Goodrow, do you know on how many occasions you spoke to Mr. Rand in person? Several. And do you know... Uh, in which year was the first time that you spoke to Mr. Rand? Oh, it had to be uh, probably within months of the arrest, so spring, early summer, 90. And what was your understanding as to um, the purpose that, well, why were you providing information to Mr. Rand? He was a reporter. He was asking me questions. On so the first time in your memory that you spoke to Mr. Rand would have been within a few months of the arrest of the Menendez brothers. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. And I believe um, that the um, foundation for the tape that we've heard in court, Exhibit 293, is that that was made sometime in the spring of 1992. Is that your understanding of when that tape recording was made? Yes. Um, to your knowledge, um, first of all, when you made the tape recording with Mr. Rand, was there a day of interviews which preceded the day that was taped? Yes. And the day that of interviews which came before the taped interview, that day was not taped. Is that correct? I don't remember. I do remember it was a two-day process. I'm not sure which day was the recording was on. And do you recall actually seeing or being aware of a tape recorder during one or both of those days that you spoke to Mr. Rand? Yes. Okay, so you were aware of the fact that you were being taped? Yes. Okay, and between um, 1990, at the first time you spoke to Mr. Rand in person, and early 1992 when the tape was made, do you know on how many other occasions you spoke to Mr. Rand in person? Again, maybe 10 on the phone. So you would have spoken to him about 10 times on the phone? Yes. Um, and so the only two face-to-face -face meetings you had with him then were the one in 1990 and the one in 1992? No, I'm sure there was one or two other ones. I just can't remember time or place. Now, the 10 or so phone calls that you had um, during the first and then this tape recorded meeting, uh, were those for the purpose of getting information from you? Yes. And um, during the course of time that you knew Mr. Rand, did Mr. Rand ever give you any information about the Menendez case? All the time. And was that something that happened fairly frequently, or was that something that happened only on occasion? Pretty much every phone call or every meeting. And um, now I believe then the indication is, is that in early or sometime in 1992 when this tape was made, that was when the subject of the um, molestation was discussed between yourself and Mr. Rand. Is that correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It was the first time that you discussed the um, subject of molestation during the meeting that's taped? I have no idea. All right, yeah, but prior to that time, you had been receiving information from Mr. Rand, is that correct? Yes. I believe you indicated at some point um, you went to the Princeton area to have your photograph taken for another article which was being prepared by reporters from the Los Angeles Times, is that correct? Yes. And during that period of time, you actually spoke with Mr. Stevens, correct? Yes, I did. And was that the first time, I, I think you testified, that you'd seen Mr. Stevens since you had been ejected from Lyle Menendez's room at Princeton in the spring of 1990, uh, 1989? Yes. Do you remember in which month in year it was that you had your picture taken at Princeton? No. Do you remember what year it was? I have no idea. 
Okay. Was it out? Had you already met Mr. Rand at the time that you interviewed with the reporters from the Los Angeles Times? Yes, because I remember seeing Mr. Rand before I went to Princeton area. Yeah, I guess that'd be the order. Were you ever aware of an article, either by reading it or by having someone tell you about it, that appeared in Vanity Fair magazine in October of 1990? Oh, yes. All right. Now, how was it that you were aware of the Vanity Fair article? Well, I think I remember a friend of mine may have mentioned it, and I went and purchased it and read it. So you actually read the Vanity Fair article? Yes. Okay. And do you remember mention in the Vanity Fair article dealing with the subject matter of sex within the Menendez family? I don't remember in the initial reading, but I do remember someone referring to it as the first time that molestation had been talked about. And do you recall that you were able to buy the Vanity Fair article on the newsstands or um, had the article already appeared and been taken off the newsstands at the, t at the time that you read it? In other words, did you read it in October of 1990? I'm sure I read it shortly after, within weeks of it coming out. Now, um, I believe you've indicated that you have no present recollection of Lyle Menendez telling you in um, the restaurant, the Chinese restaurant in Princeton, um, that he and his brother had been molested by their father. Is that correct? Yes. Um, do you remember testifying uh, previously that that was the kind of information you think you would have recalled? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And is that still your position here today, that if he had told you that, that you think he would have remembered it? Yes, it is. Um, that's a that that's I was waiting for that she uh, for her to say if to to really drill in to be like hey you absolutely one hundred percent would have remembered if he had said something about it here right hundred percent and so you don't remember that happening no I don't meaning Lyle did not tell him at this at this restaurant which it's interesting because it's it's a way of getting that testimony without him actually saying. I remember the conversation and he never told me about any of that. Um, it's, it's interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, but you know, she's also going through how many conversations did you have with Bob Rand with the journalist and was the information flow only one way? No, it was both ways. He would, he would give me information on the case all the time, new, new information that came out on, on everything. And so, you know, this is, this is establishing to say, uh, hey, you know, there there were a number of conversations where this information could have come up. I could have learned it. He could have told me, um, you know, so this is this is definitely what the what the prosecution um, what definitely definitely what the prosecution wants to be hammering in here. And she's doing it. She's doing a decent job of it, I would say. In addition, I don't know that I'm convinced, but she's doing a decent job of it. In addition to reading the Vanity Fair article um, and speaking to Mr. Rand, did you also do you have any recollection now of getting in, any other information about the Menendez case from any other source between the time of the arrests and the time that you made the tape with Mr. Rand? Not that I remember. Now, did um, during the time that you were acquainted with Lyle Menendez, that would be would have been from February of '89 until May of '89. Uh, did Mr. Lyle Menendez ever mention anything to you about a bathtub being constructed in the Calabasas home? Not that I remember. When you were here visiting for the week that he flew you out, did you ever go visit the construction site of the Calabasas home? Um, no. Okay, may I have a moment, please, Your Honor? I'm going to be referring up to the transcript, volume 55, July 27th, 1993, starting at page 7988. Mr. Goudreau, do you remember having a hearing outside the presence of the jury where we asked you questions in July about the subject matter? No, I don't remember exactly. I don't remember that, you, whether the jury was here or not. Okay, do you remember being questioned about this, though, in July of this year? Sure. Okay. Do you remember being asked the following question and giving the following answer at lines three through six? Now, Mr. Goodroll, did Lyle Menendez ever tell you that he had been sexually abused by either of his parents? And your answer was no, never. Did you give that testimony? Do you recall giving it? Yes, I did. Okay. And is it still your position today that you have no memory of him telling you that? Yes, it is. Okay. 
Now, uh, Mr. Gaudreau, when you were living at um, Princeton, you you told some stories about yourself that were untrue. Is that correct? Yes. And I believe that in the transcript, which was prepared as a result of this tape, Exhibit 293, you talked about the fact that Lyle Menendez had found out about your lies, and you referred to them as lies. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe you indicated on direct examination um, that you had a reaction in the Chinese restaurant to the way that Lyle Menendez reacted to your news of your having been molested. Do you understand my question? I reacted to the way he was reacting? Is that what you're referring Yes. To? Yes. And do you have a memory sitting here today of how you reacted or how you felt after seeing Lyle Menendez's reaction to your news? Um, not exactly, but I do remember leaving the table and I think I was somewhat emotional. Okay, and, and was your emotion caused by the news that you had told to Lyle Menendez or was it caused by the fact of how he had reacted to your news or both? Probably the news that I had told. And I'm going to object to move despite the speculation. Sustain the answer struggle. He did say probably. Do you remember testifying in July of, um, on July the 27th, council line, uh, page 7990, um, lines 5 through 9? Question, okay, what did you think when Lyle Menendez reacted the way he did to what you told him? Answer, I was shocked. He was quite emotional when I told him what had happened. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. Is that testimony accurate as to how things happened that night in the Chinese restaurant? Absolutely. Okay. Now, from how he reacted, did you in your own mind make any deductions about what his reaction meant? Uh, yes. And what did you in your own mind deduce at that time? Um, that maybe the same thing had happened to him. And do you have a specific memory sitting here today of thinking that in the Chinese restaurant? In other words, do you remember that when you were in the Chinese restaurant, you thought, boy, maybe something happened to him by the way he's reacting? I can't say how specific it was, but somewhere along the lines, I do remember feeling that way. I don't understand why she went there with that with those those questions. Uh, that's not particularly helpful to her case to, to be highlighting that. Anyway. And then after... Um, you had this conversation in the Chinese restaurant, and after Lyle Menendez was arrested, um, you were interviewed by Mr. Rand some few months after the arrest in 1990, correct? Yes. And then sometime around October of 1990, you um, read the Vanity Fair article in which there were allusions made to um, possible s sex within the family. Do you recall? When did the article come out? In October of 1990. Yes, I did. And then um, I believe you indicated that you did go to Princeton to have your picture taken, and you spoke with Glenn Stevens at that time. Is that correct? Yes. And um, I take it then, it's your testimony, you have no recollection sitting here today of what you, Mr. Stevens talked about during that picture-taking session in Princeton. Is that correct? Not. I remember bits and pieces, but nothing substantial. All right. um, and then... Um, it wasn't until 1992 that you and Mr. Rand actually discussed the subject matter, which is contained with that, the tape of Exhibit 293. Is that correct? If the tape was done in, yeah, you're right. Now, during the course of your friendship with Lyle Menendez, did he, in fact, ever tell you that he hated his father? Hated his father? He might not use such strong words, but there was definitely some dislike for some things his father had done. All right, I believe that in the second um, portion of the tape that was actually read to you by Ms. Lansing, there was reference in there to Lyle hating his father. That's something that you told to Mr. Rand. Do you remember telling Mr. Rand that? No. Okay, would it have been accurate for you to have told Mr. Rand that Lyle Menendez hated his father? I would have probably summed it all up and just said he hated his father, but that would have been correct. I believe um, you were asked some questions at page 7995 of volume 55. Um, question at line 26. Question, it could have come, it could have come from Mr. Stevens, meaning information. Your answer was yes, it could have. I don't remember hearing it or where I heard it from is what I'm saying. 
And then the uh, next question was, but the only places it could have come from, I think you said, were either Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Your answer was quite possibly yes. Next question. Or from Lyle Menendez. Answer. I don't think he ever mentioned anything about his father abusing him. Question. That you remember or you're not sure. Your answer was, I'm pretty sure he never did. Do you recall giving that testimony in court in July of 1993? Yes. And you indicated there that the um, that the only source of the information could have been Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Do you remember? I just read that part to you. Yeah, possibly. And in addition to object to misstating the evidence, that the only sources could have been. Rephrase the question, please. I believe the question asked of you by Ms. Lansing was, but the only places it could have come from, I think you said, were either Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Your answer, quite possibly yes. Do you remember giving that testimony? Yes. And in addition to Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand, you also had information from the Vanity Fair article. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Goudreau, you also had information from Lyle Menendez. Is that correct? About? Well, you were asked if you had information from Mr. Rand and Mr. Stevens in the Vanity Fair article. Is that correct? Did you have information from Mr. Stevens? I'm not sure. Did you have information from Mr. Rand? I'm not sure if it was. Did you have information from Mr. Menendez? I don't think so. But you're not sure? Not sure. Um, Mrs. Bazanich asked you about the comment about whether Lyle hated his father, and you said that that would, that would have been a short way to explain it. Can you tell me what you meant by that? Well, he, he would have expressed it. Differently, he wouldn't have just come out and said, I hated my father. He would have mentioned something specific. If he mentioned that he disliked how his father had handled something, and he wouldn't have come out and said, I hated my father. Did he love his father? Yes. Did he respect his father? Yes. Did he, was he very troubled by the way his father had treated his mother with regard to an affair? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing to say. All right, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. We'll be in recess until 1.30, and if both juries could return at 1.30, we'll resume at that time. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 1.30. Um, Tracy L. Baker. B-A-K-E-R. Miss Baker. Yes. How old are you? 24. And uh, are you currently going to school? Yes. And... Where are you going to school? Uh, Cal State Fullerton. And are you due to graduate soon? <laughs> yes, I'll graduate in December with a degree in public relations. <laughs> and are you also working while you're going to school? Yeah, I, I hold two jobs. Um, I work as a waitress at a restaurant as well as um, I work at the Anaheim Arena that just opened. Um, have you had much time? I wonder if, I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if that's the, what later became the Anaheim Pond and was what was later uh called the the honda center i don't know but if so that's like interesting to me having grown up in orange county because that's uh where the anaheim ducks play etc cetera, etc cetera. so um anyway just that was just for me i was like oh that's new and different and inter interesting personally interesting anyway i'll continue uh it's time to watch this case on television to be honest no um with my two jobs in school i don't have time for much of anything else so yeah uh, do you know Lyle and Eric Menendez? Yes. And when was it that you first met them? Um, around October of 1988. And for how long were you around them and their family? Um, approximately three months, off and on. Thank you, Seamus. I would see. I, I was right. Saw them occasionally on weekends with their parents, and also um, during the week, going out, movies, whatever. Okay. So you would have seen them in October? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And in November? Yes. <laughs> and were you there for Thanksgiving? Yes, I was. And was that the last time that you were with uh, the family together? Yes, that's the last time I saw them. Okay. So that would have been October and November of 88, is that yes. correct? You a little nervous? I'm very nervous. <laughs> How many times did you have dinner at the Menendez home? Um, two or three. And were you around Mr. and Mrs. Menendez in a, some other times in addition to those two to three dinners? Yes. And how many other times were you around them? Three or four. 
And when you were around them, was Lyle always there also? Yes, always. And was Eric there? Um, yeah, I believe he was also there all, if not one or two of the times he may not have been, but I believe he was. During one of the, did you spend time at the Menendez home? Yes. During one of the times you were at the Menendez home during this time period, did something unusual happen involving Mr. Menendez and a friend of Eric's? Yes. Where were you when this event occurred? Um, I was in, in the guest house where Lyle basically lived. Um, okay. And who was there with you? Just Lyle. And what happened? Um, he received a phone call, which I ascertained was his father calling him, by the way he responded. And apparently he had to go to the, um, the main house immediately. And his father had ordered him to come there. Lyle asked me to stay behind in the house. All right. And so it was a call from Mr. Menendez to Lyle, mm -hmm. telling Lyle to come to the main house? Yes. And was it your impression that the call was from the main house? Yes. And did you stay in the guest house as you were requested to? For a short period of time, yes. And then did something unusual happen? Yes, I heard um, loud shouting and slamming of car doors, and I was a little frightened. I didn't know what was happening, so I went to the main house. Okay. And where in the main house did you go? Um, I, I went through the house and out toward the front door, um, and I was standing right on the front stoop uh, in front of the big front door. Who else was there at this time? Um, Eric, Lyle, um, Mr. Menendez, um, I believe a, a family friend, Ed Fenno, was there, um, myself, and I, I believe uh, Mrs. Menendez was also standing in the, in the front foyer, not that, actually outside. But, uh, and also, I, I can't be sure, but I believe a, a Cole, another friend of Lyle's, may have been there. I, I don't remember. Okay. And when you got to the front step, um, what did you see? I caught the tail end of, of Mr. Menendez uh, shouting, in fact, almost screaming um, at a young man who either was getting into or out of a car in the street. And he was screaming at him, if you come near my home or my family again, I'll kill you. Whoa. And that was the tail end of what I, that was all that I heard. And okay. Now, when you heard this, did it sound like he was joking around or did he sound serious? Deadly serious. I, I was very put back. I didn't know how to react. I was very uncomfortable and it scared me. Okay. And this young man at whom he was yelling, did you see him leave? Yes, he was leaving the property. I didn't ever see his face. Okay. And after this incident, um, did Mr. Menendez return to the area where you were standing? Um, yes, he did. He, I, I believe he he, I think he may have asked me to actually go back to the guest house, but I'm unclear. I know he ordered the boys to go upstairs and wait for him. And at that point... Just a minute. When you say he ordered the boys to go upstairs, who are you talking about? Mr. Menendez. And who are the boys? Eric that he and ordered? Lyle. Relax. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he ordered Eric and Lyle to go upstairs? Yes. What did he say to them? Uh, yeah. Something to the effect go up to my room and, and I'll, I'll wait for me. I'll be right there. And you know, he, he was yelling at them. He was obviously very agitated over something one or both of them had done. Okay. Objection, Luke described um, he was obviously very agitated and everything thereafter as a conclusion on the part of the witness. Objection sustained, the answer is uh, stricken. That portion of the answer is stricken. I don't know that now, I agree with when that. When he ordered the boys, Eric and Lyle, upstairs. So, I mean, this is that's one of those that's kind of on the border that's like, is it speculative for her to to say, you know, what was upsetting him or was there something that she could piece together by his his behavior, by his body language, by, you know, uh, uh, anything? Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I agree with that call. Did he appear to still be angry or upset? Yes. And what did Lyle and Eric do? They immediately went upstairs and I was standing there, like very often had happened, not knowing what to do, feeling very uncomfortable. Okay. When you say like had very often it happened, you mean in that home or in your life? No, in, in that home. Okay. Now, you said the boys went upstairs? Yes. 
Did Mr. Menendez go upstairs? Yes, he did. And did you see Lyle and Eric again that day? Yes, I saw Lyle. Okay, how much longer, how much later, I'm sorry? Uh, it was approximately 20 or 30 minutes later, he came back to the guest house. And did you get any explanation about what that was all about? I tried asking basically what had, what had made him, his father so angry and why they had been gone so long. And he just told me that it really wasn't something that he wanted to discuss with me. It was a friend of Eric's named Craig and that it was really, that's all he wanted to tell me at that time. And I didn't feel it was appropriate to push it. Did you have, um, what, you, you said you had dinner at the Menendez home two or three times? Yes. Uh, on one of those occasions, did something unusual happen? Yes. Okay. Where was this dinner? In the dining room, in the kitchen? In the dining the room. Okay. And who was present? Eric Lyle. Mr. and Mrs. Menendez, myself, I, be I believe that was it. Okay. And was Mrs. Menendez serving the dinner? Yes, she was. She was bringing plates of food from the kitchen, placing them on the table. She hadn't yet joined us. Okay. Now, were you comfortable being there for dinner? No, I, I, as maybe you can tell, I'm uncomfortable being in front of people I don't know anyway. And parents are, are always scary when you first meet anyone's parents or family. That's I felt very uncomfortable. Um, it was a new situation to me. They were in a different social class. I just felt very uncomfortable as it was to begin with. So when you say they were a different social class, they were rich. A uh, different social class. She's about to ask about that, but I was about to comment on that, 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 you know, early on, one of the very first things that she testified about is the fact that she's in college and working two jobs to support herself going through college. So she clearly seems to be a, uh, coming from a different life than, than Eric and Lyle. I mean, in so many ways. Um, but, uh, so, so I, I anticipate that this was why I think, I think there was a lot of testimony already about Jose basically saying, you know, Tracy's like trash. Don't, don't like you, she's not marriage material. You've got to dump her, that kind of thing. Um, if I remember correctly, cause I think the only one that they approved of was the one that was, uh, um, the, the Pasadena, like the, the Rose bowl queen or something like that. Uh, if, uh the Rose parade queen, I can't remember. Anyway, anyway, let's, let's, we'll continue with the testimony. We're rich. Yes. Are you rich? No. When Mrs. Menendez put the food on the table, did something unusual happen? Yes. Um, she was standing behind me, so I don't know if she did something to provoke her husband. But before I knew it, um, he had stood up and pushed his plates out of the way, very violently knocking over all sorts of glasses and condiments, whatever, on the table. And said something to her like, what did you do to this food? Why are you serving this food? Um, and she remained silent. And I, she was behind me. And I was just thinking, my goodness, what does a person do here? Um, and, and what did a person do here? I just, yeah. what did you do? Here? I sat there and was quiet and nervous. Um, Jose ordered Eric and Lyle to go wait outside for him said nothing to me and ranted, ran, I think he maybe went upstairs or somewhere. I don't know where he went. He left the room and I was left again sitting there thinking, what do I do? And Lyle motioned to me to, to come with him. Um, I was able to grab my purse and coat and whatever else. And we went out to the front um, where the cars were parked. Okay. What did Mrs. Menendez do after Mr. Menendez pushed the food and said, what did you do to the food or why are you serving this? Whatever it was. She did said. nothing. She said nothing. And I couldn't see her. She was behind me. She, I don't, I don't even know if she was still standing in the room, to be honest. Okay. So you went outside? Yes. Were Lyle and Eric already out there? Or did they uh, go out there with you? Well, the, Eric had kind of gone first, and Lyle was sort of, I was straggling along with him. And, and I was standing, they, Eric and Lyle had gone off sort of to the side and were whispering. Um, Could you hear what they were talking about? No. This is important because of the the, the prior testimony that we heard about uh, Kitty 
wanting to unalive herself and take everybody with her. Remember, there was a lot about her trying, possibly trying to poison them. Jose became very, very anxious about food that she was giving them because he thought that she was going to do precisely that. Um, this is corroboration of that. The reason why that specifically is important to this case is because of the idea that Kitty was also equally able to to um, to take the lives of Eric and Lyle, that she was ready, willing, and able um, at some point to do that. If Jose himself was worried about that prior to this, then that means like everyone else would have had every reason to worry as well. So Tracy coming in and and telling this story of of her experience at dinner when this happened, it definitely adds a layer of corroboration to this idea that Kitty is capable, ready, capable, and and willing um, to do so. And did Mr. Menendez then show it. up at some point in time? Yeah, Eric moved um, to get in the front of the car. And um, I, Jose had opened my door for me in the back and Lyle got around the other side and Eric had asked his father something, do you, do you think she tried something on purpose or something like this? And I don't exactly know if those are the right, that's just what I remember. Um, and as I was getting in, I'm looking at Lyle, like, give me some explanation what's happening here. And he's just very silent, very sort of in his own world. Did you know what was happening? I no. I assumed perhaps you are to move to start everything I after assumed. assumed. Yep. The answer uh, no will stand. The rest of the answer is stricken as a conclusion. Yeah. Did Mr. Menendez yeah, seem anything. extremely upset? Yes, he did. Okay. Did he join you in the car then at some point in time? Oh yes. After he opened the door, he immediately got in the car. And did you and Mr. Menendez and Eric and Lyle go somewhere? Yes, we went to eat at a, a hamburger hamlet down, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes away. Okay. And did Mrs. Menendez come with you? No, she did not. Was there any discussion at the restaurant about what that had been all about? No. And once you got to the restaurant, was Mr. Menendez still angry and upset? No, absolutely the opposite. He was, I found him to be a very charming man. He was very nice to me. Um, we discussed my schooling. In fact, he's the person who made me go to a, um, a four year rather than a regular um, community college. After that conversation, I went home and wrote an essay about him and turned it in and, and I applied to my school to get, to get in. You have to write an essay to enter various colleges. And he was absolutely charming and just, I, I really uh, was amazed that someone could be so absolutely angry and then so nice to me 20 minutes later. It was wow. just bizarre. Okay. And the essay that you wrote about him, was it about his success? Yes. And on that occasion, did he tell you about his rise from rags to riches? Not specifically. Objection, um, irrelevant in here, sir. Objection sustained. The answer is true. Eh, for the rest. I suppose so. I mean, ev everything about the, 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 you know, the 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 essay that she wrote for for her college admissions is is it's not really relevant to what we need for this trial but it is interesting though right like it's it's kind of intriguing that whole thing about him being so charming uh, he, to the extent that she ended up wanting to write an an essay about him for her college admissions it's just so it's just so strange so strange rest of the meal did mr menendez continue to be charming and yes attentive to you yes were you ever given an explanation of what happened that night? No, never. And I didn't ever ask. Were you at the Menendez home for Thanksgiving dinner that year in 1988? Yes, I was. And after the meal, did Lyle leave to take a friend of his home? Yes, he did. And did this friend live up in Malibu? Yes, I think that's correct. And did Lyle ask you to wait for him while he drove the other friend home? Yes, he did. Did you wait for him? Yes. Did you receive a phone call from him at some point in time while you were still waiting? Yes, I'd fallen asleep on the couch and, and um, Kitty came with the cordless phone and said that Lyle was calling from the car and I took the call. Okay. 
And in that conversation, uh, did he ask you to continue to wait for him? Yes, and I sort of protested. I was ready to go. I was tired. And he insisted that I wait for him, that he wanted to see me. And he apologized for having had to leave. So I did decide to wait. Okay. And so after you finished your conversation with him, what happened next? Um, I, when I was finished talking with him, I got up and went to the kitchen and, and gave Kitty back the phone because I didn't know where it was supposed to be. Um, and about five minutes later, she came in the room and told me that Lyle had changed his mind that I had just better go ahead and go home. Okay. And did you question her about that? Uh, I just basically, I sort of said, are you sure? You know, he was very insistent that I stay. And she said, no, I'm sure. Um, you just better go ahead and go home. But before you do, I'd like to speak with you. And I said, okay. And so what happened then? She had asked that um, me, uh, she said, Tracy, I have, I have several questions for you. Um, and she sort of had this tone about her already accusing. And I didn't ever feel very comfortable around her anyway. And she asked me, the first question she asked me was, I having a sexual relations with her son? Whoa. And that's not something anyone's ever asked me. And I was absolutely blown away. And I was brought up to tell the truth. And I said, yes. And she was real upset. And she... What do you mean she was real upset? Well, she started, her voice and face started to look more, you know, like she was bubbling inside. And um, oh boy. I, I said to her, you know, how did you want me to answer that question, sort of? And she continued saying that she knew that I had spent the night and she didn't feel that was appropriate. Had you spent the night? Yes. Where had you spent the night? Um, once in, in the guest house, um, another, several other times in, in the maid's room. Okay, now the times you'd stay, stayed in the maid's room, that was in the main house, is that correct? Yes. And on those occasions, did Lyle stay in the guest house? Yes. And why was it that you stayed in the maid's room? I, that, I thought that was appropriate. Um, I lived far away and I didn't want to disrespect anyone in their home. And I know that in my home, it's not appropriate for people to sleep with other people. In the, do you know what I'm saying? In the right, so I, I felt that for me, it was best if I stay there to respect their home. And so what did she say to you about the relationship that you had with her son? <sighs> she... I don't remember exactly because I was just, my head was swimming because I was so embarrassed and nervous. Um, she basically was said that she had seen girls like me before oh, and that whatever I wanted from her son, I wasn't going to get. And if, if, if I thought I was going to get a hold of his money, then think, think twice. Um, Did she treat you with respect? No, absolutely not. Um, and at about this point, I, I had pretty much taken what I was going to take. Um, I went to get up, and she literally grabbed my shoulders oh, and shoved me back into the chair. And I mean, I'm getting emotional about it now. I mean, I have never had anyone physically do anything like that to me. And she just was standing above me, and I was it was just amazing that some person. I am. It's very. I sorry. I'm getting. I'm talking and rambling, but I. I was amazed and I've never had that happen to me in my life and ever in the past or in the future. Um, After she grabbed you by the shoulders and pushed you back down, did she continue to ask you questions or express her opinions about you? Yes, yeah, she continued saying that I had borrowed a pair of his sweats or something and she said, <laughs> something like, Oh, you think you can take his things and you think that you fit right in here. And, um, I, I know where you're from and, and he doesn't date girls like you. And well, you know, just, just bizarre things that a normal person doesn't say to another person. It was very rude. And I grabbed myself. I was almost crying. I grabbed my things. I ran to the guest house. Uh, I said, I'm really sorry that I offended you. And, you know, I kind of, whatever I said, I don't remember just to get out of there. I got in the car and cried all the way home. And I think to this day, my self-esteem is just, affected by it. I mean, I still feel like I'm not good enough for yeah, people. I, I need to strike everything after I think to this day is being irrelevant to the issues. Objection sustained. The rest of that portion of the answer and everything following is stricken. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. You're, you're, you're correct. It's, it's irrelevant, but like, I feel like you look a bit callous when you, when you object like that. 
to this kind of a witness. She's very sympathetic. She comes across very sympathetically, I think. And especially in this kind of a moment, like, especially if there's any jurors that that are not wealthy, that are looking at this whole thing and, and the wealth of the Menendez family and being like, mm, yeah, I don't know that I, that I really, you know, empathize too much with these people because they're all, they're all super wealthy. Um, they're likely to empathize with this witness. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> now, this incident occurred five years ago. Is that correct? Yes. When Mrs. Menendez was having this, this conversation, if you will, with you, um, were you arguing back with her? No. no. Were you trying to convince her that you were right or she was wrong or what were you doing? I was trying to calm her down. I was saying, I understand what you're saying. I can see your point of view. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to disrespect you. Uh, you know, I better go ahead and get home. Just anything I could do to calm her down so I could leave. And I did. I mean, I don't think I calmed her down, but I was able, kept inching my way. I stood up again and got away and I left. I mean, I don't. I don't think that I left probably in, in a polite way. But Now, what was she doing physically while she was yelling at you? Was she standing close to you? She was standing <clears throat> very close in front of me, um, so close that she was almost touching my legs, and she waved her arms. You know, she... You're clenching you know, your fists here and holding your fists about shoulder level. Mm -hmm. Is that what she was doing? I think so. And did you tell Lyle about this incident a few days later? Yeah, I I wasn't sure um, whether or not I should because I hadn't heard from him and I was um, very hurt. I believed what she'd said to me that he didn't want to see me. And then I got mad and I said, I'm not going to let any guy or any person treat me this way. And I called him and I told him why I left and okay. basically explained sort of what his mom had said. Was that the end of the relationship? Base, yes. I I just told him that I didn't feel it was going to really work out. Um, my living so far away and he was going to be going back to, to Princeton. Okay. Were you invited to his 21st birthday party, which would have been the January after this Thanksgiving? Yes. Section irrelevant. Sustain. Answer is correct. Did Lyle's girlfriend, Jamie, invite you to his birthday party? Yes. Did you refuse to go? Yes. Why? Direction enrollment. Sustained. Did you ever see the Menendez family again after that? No. You said that Mr. Menendez, during the time that you had gone to the hamburger restaurant, had taken some interest in you and talked to you about school. Is that correct? Yes. And did you call the house after this incident and ask to talk to Mr. Menendez? Yes, I did. And it who was... answered the phone? Um, Kitty answered the phone. This was um, in August of 1989. I wanted to go to a, a concert that the band The Who was putting on. And Jose had made mention to me that any time I was ready to get into the business, the music industry, which is what I'd like to do, or if I ever wanted anything, to give him a call. And I thought I would take advantage of that because I wanted to get some good tickets. And I okay. called and uh, Kitty answered and I asked to speak with, with Jose. And she very rudely told me that he had just come back from a business trip and he was not available to talk to me. And I asked if I could leave a message and she said that I couldn't. She, no, try calling another time she and hung up. You, did you identify yourself? Oh yeah, yeah. I said, this is Tracy, do you remember me? Nervously, of course, after my last experience with her. Okay, thank you. I have nothing for you. Any examination on behalf of Eric? Uh, just briefly. I'm not doing anything. Just wait. Um, Ms. Baker, on the evening that you were at the house where you heard Jose Menendez screaming about threatening to kill someone, you remember that evening? Yes. You said that Mr. Menendez then ordered the boys upstairs. That's right. And you said you saw Lyle 20 to 30 minutes later. Yes. Did you ever see Eric again that night? No, I did not. Thank you. I have nothing further. Hmm. Cross examination. Yes.
Ms. Baker, um, in reference to the questions that you were just asked, um, where were you physically located when you saw Lyle again that night, the night that you heard his father make these threats? I was in the guest house. Okay, and it was your understanding that that was where Lyle was staying during that period of time, is that correct? Yes. And his brother, Eric Menendez, was not staying in the guest house, correct? That's correct. Is that one of the occasions on which you, during which you spent the night at the Menendez home? Yes. Um, so would it be fair to say that you were dating Lyle Menendez in October and November of 1988? Yes. And approximately how many dates would you say you had with him? Maybe 10, a round figure. And included in these 10 dates, would the Thanksgiving dinner be one of them? Um, yeah, maybe. It, maybe between 10 and 15, that would probably be one, yeah. And I believe you indicated you had two to three family dinners and three, or there were three or four other occasions when you had spent time with the Menendez family, which were not categorized as dinners. Do you recall your testimony? Yes. Would those have been dates as well? Um, no, mostly it was while uh, they were playing tennis. I was, um, I went several times to watch them play tennis where um, their parents also came along. And when you'd go to watch them play tennis, would that be um, on the tennis court on their own property or would that be at other locations? Other locations. Okay. Now, I believe um, you've indicated that you were in the guest house and you heard some noise which caused I'm referring to the incident where the young man was either getting in or getting out of the car, and Mr. Menendez said some things. And I believe you indicated you were in the guest house at the time that you first heard some noise. Is that correct? Yes. Where in the guest house were you? On the patio. Where? You were outdoors? See, there's an upstairs patio. So a balcony? Yeah, a balcony. Yeah, okay. sorry. And so you were out of doors at that time. Is that correct? Well, yeah, there's an overhang. I, I guess I was outside. I was still within the confines of the house, but I sort of am a nosy and I was standing on the patio trying to see what I could see. Now, when you said you were trying to see what you could see, was this after your head, attention had been drawn to some noise? No. Okay, so you're out on the, pa on the balcony and you heard some noise. Is that correct? Yes. And you went to, and um, Lyle Menendez left your presence, and then shortly thereafter, you went to see what was going on. Lyle had left my presence prior to me going to the balcony, and I was curious because he left in such a hurry. I wanted to know what was happening, so I sort of was hanging out by the balcony, and at that point, I heard loud shouting, and I heard car door slamming, and this is when I went to the main house. But how long after Lyle Menendez had left your presence was it that you heard the loud noises in the car door? Two or three minutes, probably. Oh, okay. And then you left the guest house and you went out front to the, um, where the cars are parked in front of the house, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And could you tell from where the noise was coming from when you were standing on the balcony of the guest house? Generally, yes, but I knew it wasn't coming from inside the house. I could sort of tell it was out, out front, yeah. Right. And so then you went out and you saw Mr. Menendez, is that correct? Yes. And I believe you've indicated that um, in addition to yourself, Mr. Menendez, the young man in the car, Lyle Menendez and Eric Menendez, there was also a young man there named Ed Fenno. Is that correct? Yes. And potentially another friend of Lyle Menendez is named Cole. Yes. I don't remember if he was there. It's in my mind. I remember his being around at that time, but I can't be sure of that evening. Okay. By around at that time, Cole Kruger. Is this Cole Kruger? I don't know his last name. I just know his name is Cole. He's from Norway or something. Okay. And it was your recollection then that he was around the Menendez home or around when you were dating Lyle Menendez? And in what regards? I think around um, at that, uh, right before Thanksgiving time. I believe he was for there for a visit. He wasn't an omnipresent person. He wasn't there constantly. He just was, I think, on a visit. And he was staying at the home? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I don't remember. Now, Ed Fenno was another friend of Lyle Menendez's. Is that your understanding? Yes. And at that time, he was actually living in the Menendez home. Is that correct? Yes, he was. And on the occasions when you spent the night there, Ed Fenno was also spending the night there as well. Is that correct? I think sometimes Ed would spend the night away from home, but most of the time he was there in the main house. All right. So there were a number of people out in the um, area in front of the house when Mr. Menendez made this statement. Is that correct? Yes. 
And at the time that he made the statement, did he have any kind of firearms? And there was a, a handgun or a rifle or anything like that in his hands? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Did he have any kind of weapon at all that you saw in his hands at the time that he said that he would kill this young man? No, I, I didn't have a clear view of him. His back was to me, but not again, not that I'm aware of. All right. When this incident was over and the young man in the car had left, did you continue to see Mr. Menendez? Yes, he came toward us. And like I said, I don't remember if he specifically told me to go back inside or whether I just did it. Um, that was the last time I saw him. He. Okay. And when he came towards you, was he holding any weapons? No. Did he strike the young man in the car? Did you see him hit him? No, I didn't. I mentioned that I had come at the tail end. All right. But prior, but the part that you saw, he didn't hit him, correct? No, he was too far away. The guy was getting in or out of a car and on the street and Jose was still within the confounds of the driveway. Okay. So of course, I mean, this is what's going on, on, on cross-examination. The, the state of course wants to minimize the idea of, of Jose appearing to be aggressive or abusive or, 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 or right. Or a threat, a physical threat to anyone else. Defense absolutely wants to highlight this because, you know, if, if they can impress upon the jury that Jose was this, this impressive kind of person who would threaten and would make those threats look very, very real um, and sell those threats quite a bit, um, you know, regardless of whether he would have actually acted on any of those threats, the 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 question is like, do, does it seem like he would have to a to a reasonable person that that's a that's a very important thing for for the defense to try to convince the jury of the state obviously wants the jury to be convinced otherwise they want the jury to believe like okay so he may have said this thing but that doesn't necessarily mean that he would have did did he you know did he actually you know did he have a weapon on him did he have no of course not did he did he actually physically you know touch the other guy no of course not so so they're they're highlighting these things to try to to try to minimize that that box of aggression you know make that a little bit smaller um, in terms of like how big Jose the Jose the aggressor really was or or really looked, um, so that's that's what this is all about. Okay, so he, the um, young man in the car was actually on the street, correct? I think the car was sort of in. If you've ever seen the front of their home, there's a driveway, like sort of like this, and um, there's another driveway that sticks out and goes to the street, kind of. I think the car was there. So it the, was in the driveway, but not all the way into the right, yeah, area in like front of the house. Making a quick exit kind of thing. And so did you actually see Mr. Menendez when he made the statement? I don't well, yeah. Also, there, there, the, the driveway at that house is is like a, a small roundabout, too. So you go in, you loop around, and then you come out. I know because I, I, visited, I visited, but you can also look it up. You know, you can look up photos online. Um, so this is – that's that's the kind of – that's the kind of um, – um, you know, like driveway that they have. Anyway, sorry. Don't ever come back or I'll kill you or something like that. I saw the back of his head. He was yelling and I had just arrived on the scene. All right. And when you arrived on the scene, all these other people were already there with yeah. the exception of Cole, who may or may not have been. Right. There. Yes. Okay. May I have a moment, please? Now, I believe you've indicated that um, Thanksgiving was the last time that you were at the Menendez home. Is that correct? That's correct. And that if you had two or three dinners with the family and had seen them three or four other times, those four, three or four other times would have been the tennis matches that you've told us about just now? Yes. Okay. Um, before Thanksgiving dinner, how did Mrs. Menendez treat you? She really didn't ever talk to me. At one tennis match, the first one I went, she sat huddled next to her husband on the other side of me and never even gave regard to me. I just assumed that... Okay, well, I, I'm just... Now, I'm not asking what you assumed. I'm asking you if she, how she treated you. She did. She didn't acknowledge me. So you had no interaction with her, basically. At, at that time, no. Now the um, the dinner that you went to that ended up at the Hamburger Hamlet. I take it then this was before the Thanksgiving dinner, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. Excuse me. Now, I believe you indicated that um, after Thanksgiving dinner, you were waiting for Lyle Menendez to drive someone else home, and you were staying at the Menendez house during that time. Is that correct? Mm, yes. Um, had you spent the night at the Menendez home during that Thanksgiving vacation? 
um, prior to Thanksgiving dinner? I think so. I would generally stay on a weekend. So if Thanksgiving that year fell on a weekend, I, I think I probably did because I'd lived far. And were you going to school at the time? Yes. Now, when um, you had this conversation with Mrs. Menendez, I believe you indicated that before she grabbed your shoulders and caused you to sit back down, you had indicated to her that you had been having sexual relations with her son, Lyle Menendez, correct? Yes. And did she ask you if you had done this at her home? Um, she didn't specifically ask me. She told me that I had. And, and did you disagree with her? No. Was it in fact true that you had had sexual relations with Lyle Menendez in his family's home? Not in the main house. Well, the guest house? Yeah. Okay, that was part of the family home, wasn't it? Yeah. And you had no reason to believe that Lyle Menendez owned that guest house independently of his parents, did you? No. Okay. Um, did you think it was um, unreasonable for Mrs. Menendez to be upset that someone was having sex in her home? Um, I think that in this day and age, um, a 21 year old and a 19 year old, um, it's not, it, it may be a disappointment to her, but I don't think that it's so outrageous um, in this day that a person needs to be verbally assaulted the way she did to me. I don't think it's that unusual. I think that most of us in this room would probably say that that's not unusual. But you didn't ask for her, you didn't ask her permission before you spent the night with her son in the guest house and had sexual relations with her, did you? <laughs> of course not. All right. And then so she asked you and you told her that you'd been having sex in her home, in her in her family's guest house. And she got upset, right? She didn't specifically ask me in her guest house. She said, are you having a sexual relationship with my son? Something to that effect. And again, I, I'm not in the habit of making uh, lies up to people's parents that I potentially want to get to know better. And. I didn't say, yes, I'm having sex in your house, ma'am. I, I didn't say that. But she did ask you if you had spent the night there, correct? Yes, but a person, I've spent the night there on many occasions, not many, but on several occasions, and didn't have any sexual encounters at all. I would stay in the maid's room and sleep and get up and... And then see, here's the thing about this. Uh, Pam, Pam wants to come to Kitty's defense on this one. I mean... Every family is different on on what they have for standards in terms of like the girlfriend or the boyfriend staying in the same room as you know their their kid as an adult. You know she did she did point out they were they were <clears throat> they were what nineteen and twenty one at the time of this relationship, and so yeah okay sure sure you know a conversation can be had about like you know is it okay to stay in the same room as her son, but usually that conversation happens with the kid, not the kid's significant other, uh, to like make them feel incredibly uncomfortable, right? Like that's the con that's where the conversation typically happens when things are done in a healthy kind of way so that they are the ones to, to, to hold up the standard. You don't expect the significant other to, to, have a conversation, you know, with the, with, with the parent about like, is this okay? Like, uh, I don't, yeah, I just, I, she's, Pam is definitely, definitely putting Tracy on the back foot. And I understand, you know, to a certain extent, this is like what has to happen, not what has to happen, but you know, this is cross-examination. Comfort zones are, are not a thing on cross-examination. Um, but I definitely understand coming from Tracy's perspective that she's like, look, like if, if we're both adults, like how was I supposed to know, you know, what the standard is here in this family? Like no one told me I'm like, I'm not going to walk in and be like, is this okay? You know what I mean? Like, eh, it's fine. And then on other occasions you did have sexual encounters with Lama Nindis in his parents' home. Just correct. You're not asking the answer. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. Now, I believe you indicated that this the way she treated you was very upsetting to you. Is that correct? Absolutely. Did she hit you? Aside from touching you on the shoulders and forcing you back down, did she hit you? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so she grabbed you by the shoulders and forced you into a chair. But other than that, she didn't really touch you, right? She didn't actually hit you. She didn't, like like take she didn't take it a physical item and like smack you upside the head did she like that's such a ridiculous such a ridiculous question and look at look at the expression on her face as she's about to answer oh my goodness 
I, she didn't literally smack, but you know, hit me, but physically very, very hard pushed me back down into the couch. And that I would constitute as definitely physical assault. That's not normal activity. She's 100% right. Did you receive any injuries as a result of this? No. Okay. And I believe you indicate. <laughs> but did you bruise? Terrible, terrible. Did that this was very upsetting to you, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And approximately in August of 89, you called the house back to get tickets to the Who concert? Well, that, you make it sound very trivial. Um, I had established a, a pretty decent, um, not relationship, but rapport with Mr. Menendez. And I expected, I didn't know if she would answer the phone. They had a maid. I, I didn't know who would answer. And I don't think it's that unusual to ask for, for someone. I wasn't asking her for the tickets. Um, Ms. Baker, where was the maid when you spent the night in the maid's room? I, I believe she had certain weekends off. Um, the two times that I spent the night in the maid's room, two or three, I, I, she wasn't obviously there. And I, I, I think at the time, maybe they didn't have a maid. Um, I, they had either let her go or something happened because I remember specifically that I thought it was very weird that um, Mrs. Menendez was serving the dinner because she appeared to me to be sort of, you know, a rich lady. She wouldn't be serving dinner to her family. She appeared to like probably to be served and um but as a but as a matter of fact she did serve you dinner on more than one occasion didn't she um actually uh thanksgiving we had sort of a buffet style but now in august of 89 do you remember what part of august it was that you called to get tickets to the who concert it was real early in the month i think the concert was the third week of august and i wanted to make sure i had ample time to ask him so in spite of the fact that you'd suffered this trauma at the hands of Mrs. Menendez, you did call the Menendez home to get tickets to a concert. Is that correct? Oh, the way that she just asked that question was so, it was so passive aggressive. So despite the fact that you just endured this trauma at the hands of Kitty Menendez, you still f felt okay with calling the family, blah, 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 blah. Good Lord. Thank you. Nothing further. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. you. May step down. You're excused. Your next witness. Whew. My name is Marta Menendez Cano, C A N O. All right, thank you. Ms. Cano, I want to direct your attention to a meeting that you had with Lyle and Eric Menendez on the Wednesday or Thursday following your brother's death. Do you know which meeting <laughs> I'm referring to? Yes, I do. And can you tell the juries whether or not the meeting took place on Wednesday or Thursday or whether you're sure about that? I really i am not sure of which of the two nights, but I know it was one of those two evenings. And can you tell us what the purpose of the meeting was? Yes. The purpose of the meeting was to explain to them my findings <coughs> at their father's office of the financial issues of his father, of their father. And before the meeting, had you been to... Jose Menendez's office? That is correct. And why had you been to the office? Because I felt that someone in the family had to take care of Jose's pending business, and I called Marcy, his secretary, and asked her to come and get me that I wanted to go and put a financial statement together for Jose. Remember, by the way, that, that Marta already testified. She testified a lot about, about the business stuff, the financial stuff, the life insurance um, all of that kind of stuff. She was the one that kind of came in and sort of took care of a lot of a lot of these things. Found that there was a life insurance policy that that the brothers, you know, were were beneficiaries of, and all this kind of stuff. And they were like in denial. They were, said that they did not think that they were going to be inheriting anything. Um, but anyway, there was that kind of testimony. And by the way, I, I absolutely love this outfit. I don't know why. I I I love that color on her. <laughs> <laughs> it is so 90s, but <laughs> I love it. Okay, let's continue. And did you, in fact, do that? Yes, I did. And did you go to the, his office on more than one occasion? Yes, I did. And when you got done at the office, did you have certain documents that you took with you? Uh, no, I did not have anything. I asked Marcy to help me in uh, finding all Jose's personal files so I could gather together some information and, and have an idea of what Jose had pending that I might be of help. And when, if ever, did you first tell Lyle or Eric Menendez that this meeting was going to take place? I told them, I believe it's same Tuesday. I told them that I needed to talk to them. I did not specify why, and they sort of evaded me, and then I did the same thing again on Wednesday. 
I only saw them in the evening, early evening time after I left the office. And was there a meeting um, beyond the meeting you're discussing that you were preparing for? Yes, that's correct. And was that a meeting, well, who was that a meeting with? That meeting was on Friday after the memorial services, right at live entertainment with the chairman of the board. And who is that person? That's Peter Hoffman. And why did you plan to meet with Peter Hoffman on Friday after the memorial service? Because of my findings at the office of my brother, I I realized that there were some benefits of my brother that I thought that they could be negotiated. And I wanted, because of the situation where the boys were left and, and all the speculations that were being done at the time that it could have been related to the business, I thought that I could get Peter to... Um, subsidize some of the losses of the benefits that my brother had based on on the children and and help them out that way and so did you arrange for this meeting on friday with peter hoffman no i arranged it on thursday and did lyle or eric have anything to do with arranging that meeting with peter hoffman not at all did they know that such a meeting was planned to take place no they friday? did not objection sustained the answer yeah did you inform you either know? eric or lyle prior to telling them that you wanted to meet with them, that you had planned a meeting with Peter Hoffman? No, I did not. And when you contacted Lyle or Eric Menendez concerning the meeting you wanted to have with them, did you have a telephone conversation with them about the purpose? Of the no, meeting? we were all the family. When they came together, we were all the family together. So I just approached them and said, boys, I need to talk to you. It's very serious and I need to get together with you privately and they just evaded me all the time and they didn't want were not interested in getting alone with me in any kind of conversation so I had a hard time setting up that meeting and how is it that you finally did uh, conduct a meeting with him well I insisted finally that it was very important that I had uh, a meeting that I wanted to do with Peter Hoffman and that it was very important that they knew what the meeting was going to be all about so it wouldn't go over their head and I wanted them to be present as well and when you went to this meeting, where did the meeting take place? I'm sorry, which meeting? Where did the meeting take place with Eric and Lyle? In their room at the Bel Air Hotel. And was there anyone else present besides no, yourself, there was not. Eric and Lyle? Manette? No, everybody was getting to get, uh, ready to go for dinner. We were gathering all together at the dining place normally for dinner. And did you take any documents with you to the meeting? Yes, I did. Can you tell the jury what documents you took with you? Well, I took all, I did a rough financial statement of assets and liabilities of Jose, and uh, I review all the insurance things, and I review all the benefits that were inside his contract, and basically put all that together to come up with some assets, you know, the assets he owned and the assets that were speculated that he should own or whatever, put them all together to have a rough idea of what Jose was worth so I could inform the boys. And at the same time, I also put some other information that I was gonna to present to Peter Hoffman. And prior to attending the meeting with Eric and Lyle, did you have knowledge of a life insurance policy that you in fact wrote for your brother? Yes, I did. And did you have that life insurance policy with you when you went to the meeting with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday or Thursday evening? No, I did not. I, I called my office and because I couldn't find it in Jose's files, and since I had a copy of it on the file, I faxed it directly to Sun Life when I did the claim for the boys. Do you know when you submitted the claim to Sun Life? Yes, I did. On uh, Wednesday. And did either Wednesday Eric... Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning I did. Did either Eric or Lyle Menendez have any contact with you in reference to submitting that claim? No, not at all. Was that something you did on your own? That is correct. And you were you aware of the policy because you, in fact, were the person? Who That's right. I'm the agent. Anyway, agents are the ones who do that normally, so I did not need to to inform them about it. I knew it had to be done. Could I put your witness, Your Honor? Yes. Showing you, uh, Ms. Conn, what's been marked is Exhibit 140. Do you recognize that document as the insurance policy that you wrote for your brother? Yes. And was that policy written in 1987? 1986, I believe. I think it was September 1986. Uh, it says issue date January 87, but I wrote it in September 86. And physically, that policy was located where? 
after the death. Well, the application, um, the application copy was in my files in Florida, in West Palm Beach, Florida. This actual policy, I don't know where it came from. I would imagine it came from Sun Life or we never found it. And showing you what has been marked previously as exhibit number 181. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. Just tell the jury what that document is. Please. This, uh, this is a document that I roughly prepared of Jose's assets to show the boys and to myself find out what they, Jose owned, et cetera. And exhibit number 182? This is a financial statement that I found on Jose's files, which I used to lead me sort of Lee, of where to find or what to look for when I did my own financial statement. Did you find 182 prior to the meeting with Lyle and Eric Menendez? I'm sorry? Did you find that document prior to your meeting with Lyle? Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I asked Marcy about this and she told me not to believe it too much because she knew that Jose had inflated it. I can describe what Marcy said. Objection sustained. Everything after yes is stricken as yeah. non-responsive. Uh, your next question, please. Thank you. And it's exhibit number 183. Do you recognize that? Yes, I did this uh, to show Peter Huffman uh, how many liabilities of taxes the boys would be having and in order to help me in my negotiation. And is that a document that you had with you when you met with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday or Thursday? I am not sure if I had this one or if I did it. That's why I'm not sure if I saw them Wednesday or Thursday. I know I did this one on Thursday before the meeting, but I'm not sure if I had that one. And 184? These, yes, I did this exactly to discuss with the boys. These are the different issues that I wanted to talk to them about. And that's a piece of paper that says on the top, issues to discuss. That is right? correct. And along the side, there are various issues. That is correct. And 185, do you recognize that document? <laughs> yes, this is another document that I found on Jose's personal financial um, file. And uh, it's, there's a letter, and then on the, uh, it's just another financial statement that he had prepared for a bank. Now, prior to attending this meeting on Wednesday or Thursday, were you also aware of a will that your brother and his wife had executed back in 1981? Yes, I was. I was a witness on that will. And did you have that will with you when you went to this meeting on Wednesday or Thursday? No, I did not. That you were aware of. I was aware of what the of the will had, definitely. And on exhibit number 184, um, your one-page sheet, which says issues to discuss, one of the issues you have on here to discuss is the estate. That is did, correct. Did you, in fact, discuss that issue with Lyle and Eric Menendez when you had this meeting? Very briefly, because they really would not, did not want to listen to I have what I had to say. I was able to jot a couple of things to them. They just discarded the whole issue, and they told me they were not the beneficiaries of that, that they were out of the will. And do you recall what topic you discussed first in this meeting with them? I don't recall exactly what's it called, the topic that I discussed first. The first thing I told them is that I had been at their father's office and that I had been putting together their assets and liabilities, and immediately Lyle interrupted me and they said, Aunt Marta, we're not in the will. And I said, what do you mean you're not in the will? Of course you're in the will. He says, no, no, no. Then Eric said, no, Aunt Marta, we, our dad took us out of the will over a year ago. And I said, no, you're not. I remember, and you are in the will. I was a witness, and I know you are the beneficiaries of this money. So that was the beginning of the whole discussion back and forth of them trying to convince me that they had nothing to do with this. And I told them, well, whatever it is that you think you are or not, I do know that you are the beneficiary of the life insurance because I wrote that and I would know if you were changed. Let me, let me yes. break this down a little bit. Did you mention your estimate of the value of the estate? Yes, I did. And did either Lyle or Eric react in any way to your statement of what the value of the state, yes. the state was? Yes, they did. And who reacted? And Eric was, was the first one to say, I can't believe my father had so much money. And what, if anything, did Lyle say in response to that? Lyle just looked at me like not believing what I was saying. He was really pretty distrustful at the time. And did you also discuss the life insurance policy that you had written for your brother? the Sun Life life insurance policy. I began to tell them about the life insurance and they again interrupt me, I believe it was Eric, and said, and Marta, that insurance was never done. My father never took the physical. And 
Did you know what he was referring to when he, he said his father had never taken the physical? Well, I figure that it was because I had already had a conversation at live on in reference to the five million dollar policy, and I explained to him that I wasn't talking about life contract benefit, contractual benefit insurance. I was talking about another life insurance that I had written for their father, right. and I knew they were the beneficiaries. So you started talking about the Sun Life policy, correct? That is correct. And at the time you were talking about the Sun Life policy, there was also, to your knowledge, another insurance policy on your brother? There was supposed to be, based on his contract, a $5 million policy, which apparently Jose never took the medical, therefore was never done. And when Eric Menendez said that his father had not taken the physical, did you know or believe what life insurance policy he was referring to? Yes, I knew he was referring to the $5 million policy because Marcy and everyone at the office had already told me that, and we had had a, some kind of discrepancy on that. And from anything that either Lyle or Eric said, were they aware, to your knowledge, of the existence of this Sun Life policy that you had written back in 86 or 86? No, they had Objection, no. Objection, uh, calls for speculation on the part of the witness. Objection sustained the answer straight. Can you tell me what, if anything else, you said about the, the Sun Life insurance policy uh, other than what you've already indicated? I explained to them what I was talking about. I explained to them that there was a life insurance policy that I had originally written for their father many years ago, and I had converted to a higher policy back in at the end of 1986, and that I knew they were the contingent beneficiaries on that policy. And did they respond that they knew it as well? They asked me what policy was I talking about? How much was this policy for? And they say, are you sure we are the beneficiary? And Marta, my father took us out of the will. And I said, not on this one, because I would know. I definitely would know on this one because I'm the agent. And did you also have further discussion about the $5 million policy that had been issued by the company or supposedly was going no. to be issued by the company? At that point, I started... Um, talking to them what I was going to present to Peter Hoffman. And among them, I was going to make a claim to replace the $5 million policy, which was never done, but that I felt that the company had an obligation to them on a, on a, a figure like that, whether it was in other kinds of benefits or what have you. But I did feel that the company was liable on not having pursued that Jose did take this policy from his contract. That was part of his contractual employment. And what, if anything, did Lyle or Eric Menendez say in response to that suggestion? They continue telling me that they were not on the wheel, that uh, they were not the beneficiaries, so they really weren't, they were sort of discarding me. They were not interested in what I was talking about. I have one moment, Your Honor. That's all I have. Thank you. Any examination on behalf of Eric Menendez? No, Your Honor. Cross examination? Yes, please. May I have the exhibit? Yes. Actually, may we take our recess right now so I can look at these exhibits? How long is your examination? It'll be about 10 minutes. Can we just have a brief recess, like a five minute recess? Uh, let me see counsel here so we can have some idea of the schedule first. I've been trying to get some more information regarding the scheduling. Uh, in relationship to whether we'll need uh, and when we'll need both juries here. And um, we have a um, little more examination of this witness before both juries and uh, one other witness who will testify short testimony before both juries. And then we'll excuse the gold jury for the balance of the day. And um, what I'm going to probably do, and I'll talk further with the lawyers, is have you uh, come back tomorrow afternoon, and I'll give you more information about that when we come back. Uh, um, the blue jury would be here the balance of uh, today and tomorrow morning as well, but uh, the gold jury might not have to be, okay. be here until tomorrow afternoon. But let me take the recess now, give the lawyers a chance to work a little bit on their preparation here, and uh, we'll resume at 10 minutes after the hour. Don't discuss the matter with anyone. Don't form any opinions about it. We'll resume at 10 minutes after the hour. Collection that it was on. Mrs. Kahn. Okay. Of, uh, about it. We'll resume at 10 minutes after the hour. So we, we, we resume work. with the examination of the witness, cross examination. Thank you. 
Mrs. Cano, um, I believe you testified in direct examination that um, you believe that the meeting that you had with the with your two nephews occurred on either Wednesday or Thursday of the week after your brother and sister-in-law were killed. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you remember testifying at a previous hearing that it was your best recollection that it was on Thursday that the meeting occurred? I testified to both. I testified that I wasn't sure if it was Wednesday or Thursday. And when I was pressed to try to pinpoint one, I said, well, maybe it was Thursday, but I do not, I'm not sure which of the two nights it was. Um, directing court and counsel to volume 74, um, the testimony on August 23rd of this year, page 12,450. Line do you have it? Mm -hmm. Okay, line 20, question. And your best recollection of when you had the meeting with the defendants was on Thursday night, is that correct? Answer, I believe so. If you check the previous several questions, you will see what I'm referring to. Okay, so you have in fact reviewed this transcript before testifying today, is that correct? I sure have. All right. Um, you understand that um, the day on which you ha had the meeting with the defendants may have make a difference, is that correct? I don't think it makes a difference. Well, I, don't, you, I don't see why it would make a difference either Wednesday or Thursday. Do you know that on Thursday um, afternoon that your nephews bought two, three Rolex watches at the Century um, City Shopping Mall? I wasn't aware it was Thursday, but it still wouldn't make a difference <laughs> if I met with them Wednesday or Thursday. I don't see why you would refer to the difference. They didn't buy it with the estate money. They bought it with a card. With a credit card? Yes. But not so, from the state. So although you testified on August the 23rd that your best recollection was that it was Thursday, it's now your testimony um, and sometimes your testimony uh, before that it was Wednesday or Thursday that you had the meeting with the defendants. Is that I correct? I think it's the same thing I said before. If it was Thursday evening, it could have been Thursday evening. It could have also been Wednesday evening. If I'm going to be really honest, I have to say that I'm not sure either one. If you ask me which of the two you pinpoint me, maybe it was Thursday, but I really don't know. May I approach, please, Your Honor? What? May I approach, please, with exhibits 183 and 184? Yes. I believe you testified on direct examination today that exhibit 183, which is a list of assets, liabilities, taxes due, and then net and monthly payments, is a document which you prepared on Thursday, um, the following the death of your brother and sister. Could be could be Thursday. I do believe my recollection, this is the last one I did. So I probably did a Thursday morning. All right. And I mm -hmm. believe that in prior testimony you gave that you visited your brother's office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in order to get an accurate uh, picture of his financial situation. That is correct. I believe your testimony was is that exhibit 184, which is an exhibit entitled issues to discuss was an ex it was a list of things that you prepared, and for what purpose did you prepare Exhibit 184? That it was specifically for the boys. That was for Eric and Lyle. These are the situations that I wanted to talk to Eric and Lyle about. Okay, so the issues to discuss were not for any meetings with people um, at live entertainment, but rather were f was for the purpose of your discussion with your nephews. No, it's for both. I mean, I prepare for them, but of course, the information there I was going to use as well in my meeting with, with Peter Hoffman. It's, I, this is what I wanted them to be aware of before the meeting. But of course, these are issues that I was going to talk about in the meeting. And is it your recollection that you had Exhibit 184 with you at the time <coughs> that you met with the defendants to discuss their financial situation? That one? Yes, I did. Now, I believe you indicated that um, they, meaning the defendants, um, were not anxious to meet with you or didn't want to discuss finances or something to that effect. Do you recall your testimony yes, earlier? Yes, it, it had nothing to do with finances because they didn't know that that's what I, had, I was going to do. They just didn't want to meet with anyone of the family privately. I, I got that feeling anyway. Okay. Um, and would it be your uh, testimony then that the only that you only had one meeting with the defendants before the memorial service in Los Angeles dealing with the issue of assets and liabilities and those kinds of things. That is correct. And that meeting now to your best recollection was either Wednesday or Thursday night. That is correct. Okay. And you had exhibit 184 with you in preparation for the meeting with your nephews, correct? This is 184, yes. Okay, that's right. Now, I believe you indicated on Friday after the memorial service that you had a meeting with executives from live entertainment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that meeting occurred at approximately one o'clock in the afternoon? That is correct. 
aside from being at your brother's office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to check into his assets and liabilities, had you had any other meetings with any of the executives at Live Entertainment before the meeting you had at 1 o'clock on Friday, the 25th of August? I, I did. Well, they came in. I was at my brother's office, and they would come in and say something to me constantly, different people. So I don't know if you call those that meetings, but I do remember meeting, and I don't recall if it was the day before or the same day, but I do remember meeting with David um, with the two Davids before meeting with Peter Hoffman. I don't know if we were waiting for Peter or if it was the day before. I can't recall that, but I do know I met with them for a few minutes before. Now, by the two Davids, do you mean David Campbell and David Mishra? That is correct. And it's your best recollection at this time that you met with the two Davids either the Thursday or the Friday of that week? That's what I recall. I know I met with them, but I think it was one of those two days. I, I can't exactly <laughs> tell you, but I think that that's... My best recollection is one of those two days. Now, the meeting on Friday um, with Peter Hoffman, was Roger Smith at that meeting? I don't think so. Were the defendants at that meeting on Friday after the memorial service? Yes, they were. Okay, and had you had any other meetings with your nephews at live entertainment or discussions with live entertainment executives with your two nephews prior to the one o'clock meeting on Friday, the 25th of August? No. I know that we were together waiting for Peter to come in, and maybe that's what you're talking about. The only people that were present in the meeting were Carlos Baralt, Peter Hoffman, David, not David, uh, Dave, um, if you tell me the two last names, I'll tell you which Campbell one. Campbell or Mr. Campbell. David Campbell and the two boys and I. That's what I recall. And that is the meeting on Friday at 1 o'clock on August the 25th. That is correct? correct. That was during the reception. The reception was happening at live. During that meeting, was there any discussion about the $5 million life insurance policy that was part of uh, your brother's compensation package? Sure. At this time, I'm going to object with the scope and calling for hearsay. Well, the question itself does not uh, call for the substance of the conversation, just whether such a conversation occurred. But this and Objection overruled on that ground, since the subject has been raised. I don't recall, but I am. It's part of what I wanted to discuss about, but I'm not. I'm not sure that we we talked specifically of that. I believe you received. I believe you indicated that you received information that your brother had not taken the physical, which was necessary to put in force the five million dollar policy. That, that is correct. Where did you receive that information from? Different different sources. It was told to me by the. Um, Controller, it was told to me by Marcy. And of course, afterwards, it was confirmed by the boys. Before you spoke to your nephews about this fact, yes, had you had any prior discussions with them about whether or not your brother had taken the physical? In other words, you had a meeting with your nephews on Wednesday or Thursday night at which this subject was broached, the $5 million in the physical, correct? That's correct. Had you had any prior discussions with your nephews before this meeting? With about my the nephews? No. About the physical for the $5 million policy. No, not with my nephews. Okay, so the first time that you became aware that they had knowledge about the $5 million policy and the physical was during this meeting you had with them in preparation for the meeting you had on Friday, August the 25th. That is correct. Okay. Now, I believe you indicated that um, during this meeting with your nephews, um, you had some you had a state of mind that your brother had written a will which had left his estate to his sons in the event that his wife um, died, predeceased him or died at the same time, correct? Yes, that was a will done okay. in the past. And at the time that you had this discussion on Wednesday or Thursday of that week, um, had you seen a copy of the will since the death of your brother and sister-in-law? No, I had not. I did have one in my files at home, at my office in Florida, but I had not looked at it. And when you came into town, I believe you came to Los Angeles on Monday, the 21st of August. Is that correct? That is correct. And when you came into town, did you bring a copy of the will with you? No, I did not. I believe it's your testimony that um, the following day, which was Tuesday, the 22nd of August, you began your search at your brother's office to look for his assets and liabilities. That is correct. Were it's you asked morning Tuesday? Were you asked by anyone to do that? No, as I stated before, I there was a call coming in. Carlos and all the men had left, looking for 
the safe deposit to see if they could find the wheel or what have you. And we was I was with my sister Terry. Terry answered the phone, and it was a call from the broker's firm. And when that margin call came about, that's when I realized that what am I doing here, sitting and and crying? I have to go and try to put things together for Jose because there might be some issues that need to be resolved. That's I did it on my own. I just called Marcy and told her to come and pick me up. And that was Marzi Eisenberg, your that is correct. brother secretary at yes. the time of his death, correct? Mm -hmm. And did she in fact come and get you on that Tuesday and take you to live entertainment? Yes, she came on a limo to pick me up. Did she come and pick you up on any of the other days to take you to live entertainment to continue your search? Yes, she did. She uh, picked me up every single morning. Um, I believe you indicated. I would imagine that this, I mean, this, this, there's nothing about what Marta has testified to having done. That seems strange to me, especially if, if you've, you've been involved in their family, you know, to the extent that the testimony suggests here, a, you know, they, they, they still have, they were going to all of the family gatherings and things like that while they were living in the same area as everybody else while they were all living in New Jersey and B, I mean, she's, she, she sold him the insurance policy. So it seems like, like this, this would be normal for her to step in to, to, uh, you know, manage his, his financial affairs for her brother in the event of his death, it just, to me, it, it seems, it seems perfectly normal. Like if, if God forbid something happened to one of my siblings, I would probably be someone who would be stepping in and, you know, if, if they didn't, were not survived by a spouse, of course. Right. But I would probably be someone to, to be stepping in as the lawyer of the family. Right. Um, it just, it just kind of, it just kind of makes sense for, for someone like that to, to step in because they have a certain professional expertise. They're close enough to the family. They know the, 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 you know, the, the brothers, the, the sons of the two who have passed. It just, it, I don't know. It makes sense to me. Maybe someone else is, you know, sees differently and, and is a little bit off put by just how, how involved she was, but I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't see it that way especially if you if you come from a relatively modestly tight-knit family, right? I mean, obviously they were only so close, the Menendez family, but um, they still work, I think, close enough for this to be normal. Kated, um, that you told the defendants what your estimate was of the um, estate of your dead brother. Do you remember your testimony? Yes. And what figure did you quote them? Well, I I quote them on a gross basis around 14 million. And you say that they expressed a surprise at that amount. Is that correct? Honestly, not only surprised, they were not even interested in what I was talking about. They said, I'm Marta, we're not in the wheel. They just did not. The only surprise that I heard is when Eric said, I can't believe my father had so much money. Had you ever stayed at your brother's home in Beverly Hills prior to his death? Yes. Okay. Do you know how much he paid for that home? I know now. I didn't know at the time. Do you know how much he paid for that home? I think it's approximately around $5 million. Now, um, during the... It's worth so much more today. Can you imagine 1993 versus 2024 now? <laughs> week that you were, well, the four or five days that we, you were in Los Angeles before the memorial service, did you ever go to your brother and sister-in-law's home uh, for the purpose of searching for any assets or liabilities in the home? No, I did not. Did you ever go to the home at all during that period of no, time? No, I did not. Also, sorry, that was, I said 1993, but I think what she testified to was what Jose bought the house for, which would have been in the late 80s. So, like, even even more of a difference. Anyway. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Briefly. Was the $14 million figure that you mentioned an accurate figure, to your knowledge? It was inaccurate, yes. Accurate or in inaccurate? Inaccurate. That's correct. And did you also mention a a, uh, a net figure as yes, well? Yes, I did. And do you know what that figure was? Are you talking about the conversation uh, with the two defendants? Yes, Your Honor. In this conversation with yes. the two defendants. The net you? figure was around seven or eight million. I can't recall right now which one of the two. But and those were your computations? That was my computation based on all the gatherings that I did at his office. And was that also accurate or inaccurate? It was inaccurate. Both those figures were inaccurate. That is correct. 
and they expressed surprise as to both those figures? Yes. You were asked whether you stated in prior testimony, and in answer to the question, your best recollection of when you had the meeting with the defendants was on Thursday, and your answer, I believe so. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do. Do you also remember being asked this question? Do you remember when that discussion was? And this is at page 12422, line 15. Do you remember being asked this question? Do you remember when that discussion was? And your answer, that it was either Wednesday night or Thursday night. I don't recall which of the two nights, but I'm definitely sure that it was before Friday, which was the memorial. That is correct. And is that still your testimony? That is correct. The $5 million figure for the house, did you determine how much uh, was owed on the mortgage for that house? I think it had a very large mortgage, but I don't, re I think it was two and a half million in mortgage. And was the house, my recollection. was the house sold to your knowledge? The house was sold. Do you know what it was sold for? Objection or relevant? Overall. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was sold around three and a half, four million, something on those numbers. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. May I step down. All right. It's Armando A R M A N D O Lopez L O P E Z. The private investigator. <laughs> Mr. Lopez, what is your occupation, sir? I'm a private investigator. And uh, are you appointed by the court to be a private investigator on this case on behalf of the defendants, uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez? Yes, ma'am. And would you tell the jury what your background is in investigations and law enforcement? Um, I was a police officer for the city of Santa Monica uh, for approximately 17 years, uh, three of which were patrol and the remainder were in the detective bureau as an investigator. And in the course of your employment as a Santa Monica police officer, did you become familiar with firearms? Yes, ma'am, I did. Now, one minute, guys, I've got to take a break real quick. Uh, I'm going to step out just for a second. I'll be back in like two minutes. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> And we're back. All righty. Let's continue on. Now, do you see the two photographs that are up on the board? 
Yes. And you see the other series of photographs in front of you, all of which comprise exhibits 281 through 290. Also, really quick. Sorry. Oh, actually, let me let me let him in. Yes. And did you take those photographs, Mr. Lopez? Yes, I did. Okay, one second. Uh, there was a question here from Tish about uh, did about some of the the witnesses. Did, did some of the defense have their witnesses early in the trial during the time of the prosecution was proving their case by having their witnesses? Good question. So yes, yeah, some some of these witnesses have testified previously in this trial, and that's because they were called by the prosecution as witnesses. And then they were later recalled by the defense in their case in chief as well to ask about other things that came up, you know, so, so you can, um, a lot of these witnesses can be recalled by one side. So you'll notice at the end of someone's testimony, sometimes, I mean, here, I think a lot of them have been, have been like cut off in, in terms of like what's saved and retained by court TV. But, um, you know, the, the, the judge before releasing a witness is going to, you know, instruct the, the witness to say like, Hey, you can be recalled, you know, in case one side or the other decides that they want to call you back. Um, so, you know, here, here are your instructions for what you can and can't do. Um, or the judge will say, okay, you've been released. Like, in other words, like you've been completely released. You can do whatever you want. You're free to go. Um, so, here, like a lot of the the witnesses that have testified today, well, two two of the three that we've seen so far have been recalled. So, where did you take them? In the city of Santa Monica, at the Big Five store on Wilshire Boulevard. And when did you take them? Uh, I took those. I believe it was October fourth of nineteen ninety three. Yes. And how did you come to take those photographs? Was Were you instructed to do so? Uh, yes, I was. And who told you to do that? Uh, I believe it was Miss Lansing. And had you gone to the Big Five store in Santa Monica before October 4th, 1993? Yes, I did. And on what date did you go there? Uh, I believe it was uh, the first. It was a Friday, October and 1st. Did you make certain observations on that Friday, October 1st, when you were at that location? Yes, I did. And did you report those observations to Miss Lansing? Yes, I did. And was it then that you were instructed to go back and take photographs? Yes. Now, calling your attention to the photographs that are in front of you and the photographs on the board, <clears throat> what do those photographs basically depict? Um, the, the photographs on the board... Uh, the one on the left uh, depicts a glass cabinet um, with what appear to be firearms uh, laying on the, the top shelf. Uh, now, when you entered this store on October 1st, uh, the Friday, uh, did you at some point observe that glass cabinet? Yes, I did. And at the point when you first observed it, did you notice that it had what appeared to be firearms in it? Yes. And could you tell at that point whether they were real firearms or pellet guns? When, um, when I first saw them, they appeared to be real. Okay. And as you got closer to the cabinet at some point, did they still appear to be real? Um, as, as I approached the cabinet, looked at them closely, I realized they were not real. Okay. And was that based on your prior experience or was there a label on them that said pellet gun, not real, anything like that? Uh, it was based on my experience. This cabinet, did you make any observations about the condition of the glass cabinet uh, with respect to its potential age? Objection, uh, lack of foundation. Rephrase the question. Okay, did you make any observations about the condition of the cabinet? Yes, I did. And what was the, con what did you observe about its condition? Uh, I observed that the cabinet was made of glass and the top of the cabinet had um, several scratches on the top. Did they appear to be fresh scratches? Um, some appeared to be fresh. The remainder appeared to be very uh, old 
scratches. Now, did you um, contact any persons who uh, worked in that particular Big Five store uh, prior to August of 1989? I'm sorry. I, I, uh, did you make contact with any person who or persons who worked in that particular Big Five store prior to August of 1989? Yes, I did. And uh, did you were you able to ascertain whether uh, firearms similar to the ones that are depicted in that photograph were carried in the stores prior to August 1989? Yes. And were they? Yes. Were you personally, from your experience in law enforcement, familiar with any of the uh, firearms depicted in that cabinet as having been something manufactured uh, prior to August of 1989. When you refer to firearms, what are you referring to? These pellet guns, Your Honor. Yes. It turned out that all the guns in that cabinet were pellet guns, correct? That's correct. And did you determine from, strike that, did you recognize any of those guns as guns that you were familiar with uh, prior to August of 1989? Yes. In your experience in law enforcement, had you come across pellet guns that resembled um, real handguns? Yes. Now, did you um, make an effort to ascertain whether there were other sporting goods stores in the general West L.A. Santa Monica area that sold either pellet guns in the shape of handguns or real handguns in August of 1989? Correction irrelevant. We'll roll. You answer the question. Yes. And are, did you receive information that certain establishments that were in existence in August of 1989 are, on, are no longer in existence? Yes. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any examination on behalf of Lyle Menendez? No, Your Honor. All right, uh, cross examination. Mr. Lopez, how long have you been employed as an investigator in the Menendez case? Um, approximately six months, I believe. Six months as of today's date? Uh, I'm not sure the exact date. During the period of time that you were at the uh, Big Five, uh, this is on Wilshire Boulevard, correct? The Big Five on Wilshire? Yes. Yes. And that's where you took the pictures that are on the board and in front of you? <laughs> Yes, it is. And during the period of time that you were there, did you attempt to ascertain the identity of the person who waited on the defendants on August the 18th of 1989? No. Were you asked to do that? No. I don't recall it was. All right. So you don't recall if you were asked, but you definitely made no effort to find the identity of the person who waited on the defendants on August the 18th of 1989. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were asked to go there for the first time on October the 1st of this year, is that correct? That's correct. And prior to that, uh, October the 1st, you had never visited this Big Five on Wilshire Boulevard in connection with the Menendez case, is that correct? Yes. Now, when you went in and you took the photographs, which are displayed on the board and also in front of you, did you ask any one of those were in fact the same display cases that they had in 1989? Did I ask? Anybody? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. And did you ask anyone if the display cases were set up identically to how they were set up in 1989? Yes, I did. What did they say? You, do you know for a fact that that uh, cabinet was there in 1989? No. Now, when you went into the Big Five um, on October the 4th to take these photographs, um, did anyone at the Big Five tell you that there was a 14-day waiting period to buy pellet guns? 
No. And is it your understanding, having been a police officer for 17 years and also a private investigator for a period of time, that there is no waiting period in California to buy pellet guns? Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And there never has been a waiting period to buy pellet guns. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And the condition of the cabinet, as is displayed in the photograph um, on the board and the photographs in front of you, you have no personal knowledge that that is how the cabinet looked on August the 18th of 1989. Is that correct? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because I did speak to somebody about the glass cabinet and but, how it looked prior to 1989. But you have no personal knowledge of how the cabinet looked in 1989, is that correct? That's correct. You have no recollection of going into the Big Five in 1989 in August and looking at the cabinet and then making a comparison with the photographs you took last week, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I these are these are some these are some fair questions, honestly, because he's 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 coming out and basically testifying that, you know, hey, I took these photos of the of the glass cabinets. This is, you know, the, the these guns over here are apparently not real. They look very real, um, and so this this was this was to to get back to Eric's testimony about whether the guns over there were real or not real. Um, how, how much how much you care about that testimony is I don't know, one way or another, but <clears throat> but um, so so but the point here with with cross examination is. You know, she's saying like, hey, but you don't know, you know, what those glass cases looked like in 1989. And how do we know that these photos actually reflect what it looked like in 1989? This is what it looked like, you know, six months ago or whenever this was during, you know, dur during the the defense, you know, build building of their case, um, which is certainly a lot longer after everything that had happened. So these are these are honestly these are, these are fair questions from Pam on cross examination. I have nothing further. Yes, Mr. Lopez, you did, however, verify with an employee of that big five that, in his opinion, the cabinet's the same and looks the same. Objection calls for hearsay. Objection system. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, I, I I knew as as soon as you know on cross examination, Pam Pam asked him, you know, did you have conversations with anyone about about what it looked like before. And then she moved on to like another subject. And I, I, I literally said, I was like, okay. And what did they say? But obviously that is hearsay that, that that's hearsay because it's, it, he would be, he would be answering to say, well, they said that it was the same thing in 1989. So therefore it was the same in 1989 that that is like squarely on the nose hearsay testimony. Mrs. Basanich asked you if you had tried to determine if it was the same display and if it looked the same, correct? That's correct. And you did make those inquiries, did you not? Yes, I did. And uh, there is um, a former employee who you have arranged to have come testify here as a witness, correct? That's correct. Thank you. <coughs> Anything else? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, sir. You can step down. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, let me see counsel at the sidebar regarding the scheduling, please. Okay, we've uh, excused the gold jury, and now we'll resume with the blue jury. You folks have been so uh, good. We wanted to keep you here and uh, enjoy seeing all your smiling faces. So we'll continue. The defense may call its next witness. Yes, it's going to be Andy Cano. <clears throat> All right. Did you want to be excused? Okay. All right. We'll excuse uh, Mr. Lauman and this. Wait. Uh, it's... All right. Stand behind the court reporter over here and then face the court clerk, please. Andres Cano, 
A N D R E S C A N O. Mr. Connor, you have to pull the mic so it's facing directly at you. Okay. And we fixed it so, it so it doesn't move like closer. Right. Okay. Um, are you usually referred to as Andy Cano? Yes, sir. Where were you born, Mr. Cano? I was born in Livingston, New Jersey. Where were you raised in your uh, earliest childhood years? Puerto Rico. And who, who did you live in Puerto Rico with? My mother and my father. You're a little too far from the microphone. Okay. okay. And your mother is who? Marta Cano. And uh, was Jose Menendez your uncle? Yes, he was. You and have to speak up also. Okay. Your mic doesn't pick up your voice. Okay. Takes a few minutes to get used to where yeah. you should be. And are you therefore first cousin to uh, Eric and Lyle Menendez? Yes, I am. At uh, some point, did your family, uh, you and your mother, your brother and sisters, move to new back to New Jersey? Yes, we did. And do you recall approximately how old you were when your family moved to New Jersey? Well, I would have been six years old. I was in 79. And at the time when you and your family moved to New Jersey, were your parents separated and or divorced? Yes, they were. I believe uh, they got divorced uh, right after I moved there. I'm not sure. Now, currently... Uh, there's also a question here. Carolyn B., do we know why Lyle may have left? So the reason is because Lyle's, Lyle's jury was excused, and so he doesn't need to be there and and realistically like i mean it's it's this testimony is not his trial technically because his jury his jury isn't isn't in the room um so uh so yeah that's that's why currently mr Kano, what do you do for a living well i'm a student a full-time student and where do you go to school ucf which is uh university of central florida in orlando and have you been and are you still athletic? Certainly relevant. Overall. Yes, I am. And what is your sport? Soccer. And do you, uh, you play soccer, I take it, you're on teams? Yes, I am. Do you also teach it and coach it? Yes, I do. Overall. When you were six years old and your family moved to New Jersey, did you play soccer then? I believe I started when I was seven years old. I didn't play in Puerto Rico, no, but uh, once I went to New Jersey, yes, I started. And were you um, aware of whether or not your cousin Eric Menendez also played soccer? Yes, he did. Were you aware of other sports that, uh, that your cousin Eric was involved in? Well, later on he became involved in tennis, but that's uh, all I know. Now, did you form a friendship with your cousin, Eric Menendez? Yes. Approximately how old were you and how old was he when the two of you became friends? Well, uh, I was probably seven, year old, seven years old when we really became friends, uh, but I had met him previously. Had you visited um, with your cousin, Eric Menendez's family while you were still living in Puerto Rico? Yes, I did. Had you seen him and his parents and his brother at family gatherings over different times of the year while you were still living in Puerto Rico? I don't remember if we came up or not. Okay. Once you moved back to the mainland, uh, did you see more of him? Yes. Now, would you uh, from time to time ever stay over at... Eric and Lyle's house. <laughs> yes, I did. And do you recall basically whether there was a pattern to this? I mean, what types of days, what days of the week would you stay well, over? It was mostly on the weekends. And do you know over what age, your age, would you stay over at Eric and Lyle's house? Well, it varied between ages. Uh, I would say between my ages of eight and 10 years old it was the times that I most often was able to go over his house. And after that, it was less frequent? That's right. When you were 10 years old, how old was Eric? He was 12 and a half. 
That's right. Now, were there occasions when your cousin Eric ever stayed at your house? Very few times. I can only recall one. Do you recall a time when your cousin Eric was playing at your house where in the course of your time together, he told you something you had not heard before? Yes, I do. And can you first tell us um, where were you guys physically when this play began? Okay. Uh, what I recall is this. Uh, like I said before, this is one of the few times that he was able to come to my house uh, for any activities. Uh, and this particular time, uh, I remember it being winter time, and there were fields behind my house, agricultural fields. Uh, and they would, it would be a field and then a strip of woods, and then there would be another field and another strip of woods and so on. And we were back in the fields. Okay, and you were playing some kind of game in the fields behind your house? Yeah. That, that's right. We had toy guns, and we were pretending like we were running from an army. We would play war games pretty often. What was the name of this particular game? Do you remember? Well, I just remember we were running from the Russians. I don't know if to call it that <laughs> game or not, but... Uh, but that's what you were pretending. That's, that's what we were pretending at the time. And at some point while you were pretending to run from the Russians, did something happen that made the two of you take cover or hide? Yes. What happened? Okay. Uh, there was a farmer... Uh, that owned the fields, I guess. And I had heard stories from other neighborhood kids and so on that uh, he was pretty mean to people that passed by the fields or would play in the fields. And uh, that time there was a helicopter and we thought that it was him. And a the helicopter, helicopter, you mean, was flying? It was flying over us and it seemed very close to us. And we, we thought for sure that it was the farmer spotting people on the fields. <laughs> And we, I was very scared, and I definitely told him about it, so we started running. And where did you get to? Well, we got to the woods, and then we decided that we were going to run. We were going to split up, and we were going to run to a tree uh, in another patch of woods, a couple fields afterwards, that we both knew about, and we were going to run and meet at the tree. Okay, and did you run and meet at the tree? Yes, we did. And did you spend some time at the tree hiding from the farmer? Yes. And during the time that you were at the tree hiding from the farmer, did Eric begin a conversation with you? Yes. And do you recall how the conversation began? Well, yes, I do. Okay. Would you tell us how it began? He asked me if uh, my dad ever gave me massages. Oh, boy. And did you understand at that point what he... This is a good time to remind everyone that we have a general trigger warning uh, about any kind of abuse. There's likely to be testimony about abuse. If you have a hard time with it, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. It is not worth it. It is not worth your mental health. Uh, so we are definitely going to be getting into that kind of testimony here. What he meant. No, I didn't. And do you recall basically what your response to him was? Well, uh, at that point, I got the feeling, uh, I'm sure he let me know this, but uh, he was actually trying to find out if any of these massages were normal. And I, my response to him was that I wouldn't know. I didn't have a father around. My parents were divorced then. And uh, I really couldn't help him. Let me ask you this. He asked you whether your father gave you massages. That's right. Did you, you said he was trying to find out if it was normal. Was there something else he told you about the massages? Like where they were? Yes, he did. Okay. What did he say about where the massages were? Well, he told me his father was massaging his dick. He used that word? Yes, he did. And he was asking you some kind of question about this kind of behavior? He was, seemed like he was reaching out to me. Objection, speculation. Sustained. See if we can reconstruct this, Mr. Conner. First, he asked you, does your dad give you massages, something like that? That's right. 
And then do you ask him anything like what kind of massages? What do you mean by massages? I'm sure I did. And then he tells you that he's talking about his dad massages his dick or does something to his dick is what he tells you. That's right. So then does he ask you again, does this happen to you or anything like that? Yes. He, uh, at that point, we were both trying to figure out whether what was happening to him was normal. He okay. wanted to know that if this happened to every kid with uh, a father and son relationship and I couldn't help him, I didn't have a father around. So you said, I, I don't know, my dad's not here. That's right. Okay. Said something to that effect. Okay. And what else is said as best you can remember in the course of this particular conversation? Well, what uh, I do remember very specifically was him asking me to make a promise to him never to reveal that to anybody. And uh, he was saying it very seriously, and I took it very seriously. Had you suggested at any point in the conversation revealing it to someone or telling someone or asking someone about it? Well, at that point, I was wondering myself, and I really wanted to ask my mother if that was normal. Did you six mention that to Eric? Yes, I did. And was it after that that he made you promise? I don't remember. It, uh, it was probably after that, yes. So you told him, I don't know if it's normal. Why don't I ask my mom? Something like exactly. that? Exactly. And what did he say to you when you <clears throat> suggested asking your mother? He told me never to reveal it to anybody to promise him that I would keep it a secret between us. Now, were there any other times that you were with your cousin Eric when this topic of massages with his father came up? There were several times, I recall. And do you remember where these conversations came up? Yes, I do. In his bedroom in the Pennington house. And were on these occasions when you were visiting or sleeping over or something else? Most likely sleeping over. I remember most of them took place at night. And do you remember anything about, uh, first of all, the, the next time it came up? Do you have any idea of when that was in relation to this winter time when you were playing Running from the Russians? I'm sorry? When was the next time? Do you have any idea? Well, it uh, was probably a month later. Why do you that say that? That would be that? My, my best. Day. Because I remember it not being exactly later, but it wasn't too far along the road. It was definitely probably about a month's time that had passed. Did you see your cousin Eric more frequently than once or twice a month at this time? No. And do you recall generally what the topic was the next time it came up? Well, it was sort of a continuation of the conversation we had in the woods, uh, just basically contemplating on whether it was normal or not. Okay. And was there anything else that occurred in this conversation that you can remember? Did Eric ask you anything? Well, I remember he told me again never to tell anybody. And uh, I brought it up again that maybe he should uh, let me ask my mother. And uh, I remember him replying no. And I asked him why didn't he let uh, his mother know or ask his mother. Yeah. Do you remember what he said when you asked why didn't he ask his mother? Yes, I do. What did he say? He said that uh, she would get mad at his father. Now, do you recall a subsequent occasion, another occasion when this topic was being discussed between you and Eric, where he gave you some additional information about what was going on? Yes. And uh, can you recall that, you know, tell us what you can remember of that yeah. conversation? What I can remember of that conversation uh, is very little, but uh, I do remember very well that he explained to me that the, these massages that his father was giving him were beginning to hurt. 
And do you remember whether or not you understood what that meant? Or I definitely didn't understand. And did, do you recall whether or not you tried to gather any information about why massages were hurting? I would imagine I did, but uh, I don't remember. Okay. Did you ask Eric straight out, why does it hurt, or how does it hurt, or what is he doing that's making you hurt? If I did, I don't remember. Okay. And you don't remember his ever elaborating on it? <laughs> he didn't tell you anything about tacks or needles or ropes or anything no, like that? No, he didn't. Were you familiar with uh, a nickname that your cousin Eric used to refer to himself at about this same time? Yes, I did. And what was that nickname? It was Hurt Man. Now, did he express to you in this last conversation um, his desire with respect to these massages with his father, what he wanted? What his father wanted? No, what Eric wanted. What Eric wanted? Uh, yeah, he told me he wanted him to stop. Uh, I remember that being the last conversation that I remember. <coughs> and was there any further discussion uh, with him about your knowing about this? I'm sorry. Can you okay. Say In this last conversation, was there any further discussion with Eric about your knowing about what was going on with him and his dad? Well, it was very clear that he wanted to, to keep it as a secret between us and that I was never going to reveal that to anybody. And I had promised him, I had swore to him that I wouldn't. Uh, but he definitely seemed nervous. Seemed nervous about what, Mr. Connor? That I might tell somebody. From what you had observed in the family, did it appear to you that Eric was afraid of his father? Yes. Were you afraid of his father? I was. Now, you, when you slept over at the Menendez home, did you sleep in Eric's bedroom? Yes. And do you recall whether or not there was a loose slat from his bed? Yes, I do. Was there? Yes, there was. And do you recall what that, what, did you ever see anybody use that slat for any purpose? Eric and I used it once to pin the door from opening. There were no locks on the doors. So you could prop the door closed with the slat? That's right. And did you see that loose slat there on more than one occasion? Yeah, uh, there was a trundle bed under his bed uh, that you, can, you could slide out. And usually when you pulled it out, the slat would fall mm -hmm. and it'd have to be placed back on. Okay. So I do remember it several times falling off. And on this one occasion, you remember actually using it to prop the door. That's right. Did you think of that or did Eric show you how to oh, do Oh, Eric that? showed me that. Do you recall an occasion, Mr. Kana, when you were staying at Eric's house or visiting his house when you hurt yourself and you wanted to use something on your injury? Yes. And how did you hurt yourself first? Well, we, uh, Eric and I would usually go outside and play through the woods and so on. Why don't you clarify that? Do you recall approximately how old you were at the time you're talking about when you hurt yourself? I believe I was around 11 years old. It's the best I can do. Okay, so if you're 11, then Eric's about 13 and a half to 14? Right. So you and Eric would play in the woods and you'd get hurt? <laughs> I got scratched on a log or on a branch or something. My leg did. Okay, so what did you do about that? Well, I wiped it off, but... Uh, when we went back to his room, I remember seeing uh, a jar of Vaseline 
Ooh. Well, I didn't know what it was used for or what it was then, but I figured it was a type of ointment that you put on scratches and so on. Okay, so did you did you try to use it for your scratch? I picked it up, and Eric immediately told me to put it back down. Okay, did he say anything else about it? No, he didn't. He just said, don't touch it. Well, did you explain why you wanted to use it? Yes, I told him I was just going to put it on my scratch. And did he tell you anything about that? Yeah, he said that's not what it's for. I have nothing further. Cross-examination. Your Honor, is there a glass of water or something? That would be great. Oh, God. Why is it the Kuriyama is always the one that is cross-examining on, like, this kind of testimony? I absolutely hate it. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. Connell, how old were you when you had this uh, alleged conversation with Eric Menendez in this field? I believe I was 10 years old at the time. And Eric Menendez was about 13? He would have been going on 13. It was winter time. Thank you very much. And this is the first time you had ever heard of these massages? That's right. And when he told you that, uh, you didn't tell anyone which, what he had told you? No. And you recall this happening in the winter sometime? Yeah, that's right. And the next, next conversation that you had with him was when? About a month later. And it was in the same field? No, it was in his bedroom at home. <clears throat> and he brought up the subject again? Yes. And was there a third conversation? Yes, there was. Now, I know I must have brought up the conversation at least once. I remember bringing it up. I don't remember how I did. At some point, though, you again talked to uh, your cousin about these massages. That's right. And this was about how much um, later? About a month later, I would say, from the first occurrence is what you're asking? Yes. Yes. So there's, it's been spaced out about a month apart, these three conversations, a month each. I'm sorry, would you ask me again? The, the first conversation occurred when you were in the field. About a month later, you had a conversation with your cousin, Eric Menendez, yeah. in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. And then about a month after that, you had another conversation with him? I don't him? remember when exactly those other two took place. Uh, but the second conversation I had was about a month later. I don't remember about the other ones, how much later they were. And he talked about a, a massage that his father had given him? That's right. And on every one of these occasions, did he talk about a massage? Uh, I don't remember if on the third or fourth he did, but uh, I, I knew by then what he was talking about, so he didn't have to let me know. And he asked you if your father ever gave you a massage like that? Yes, he did. Now, did you ever tell anybody about this? I didn't tell anybody until I told uh, Miss Leslie Abramson. And that was sometime after Eric Menendez was arrested for the murders of his parents? That's right. Now, after uh, your cousin was arrested, did he give you his car? His car, I'm his sorry? His car? I don't believe he gave it to me. I bought it from him. You bought it from him? That's right. What did you pay My for it? My mother did. What did you pay for it? I don't remember. What kind of car was it? It's a Ford Escort. Now, when your cousin was arrested, he was uh, 19 years old, correct? I believe so. And you were 16 at the time? That's right. So you were just starting to drive? That's right. Now, it's your understanding that you bought that car? Yes, my mother, I believe, bought it. You don't know that, though? No, I do know that. You know that she bought it? Yes. And do you have any idea of what she paid for it? Then? I have no idea. 
Uh, you're, uh, I can see that 16 year old. Like, do you just know that your, your mom or your dad bought it off of a family member? And all you care about is the fact that you now have a car. <laughs> I can, I can totally, I can totally picture that, you know, with, with any teenager at, at 16, especially. Uh, cousin was a good friend of yours, right? Yes, he was. And is. And is. And uh, I believe your mother had testified that she would lie for the brothers. Would you also do that? Objection, Your Honor. The testimony more, but it's improper. It's argumentative. Right. Objection sustained. Would Would you lie for Eric Menendez? I am not lying for him now, and I wouldn't lie for anybody under oath. You would not. I would not, Mr. Crayon. And you never told anyone this until after your cousin was arrested. That's right. right. Yes, he was in the shower. <laughs> now, there's been testimony that you accompanied Eric Menendez from Florida to Los Angeles um, after he came back from Israel. Do mm -hmm. you remember that? Yes, I do. Did he tell you that he was involved in the killings of his parents on that uh, plane flight from Florida to Los Angeles? No, I. Uh, we talked for a while, but it was mostly concerning of how he was doing. Um I don't recall too much of that conversation. He wasn't, uh, he, he was very upset. He was very emotional and he wasn't in the mood to talk. About where, where did you meet him? Did you meet him in Florida somewhere? In Miami, in, in Miami. Miami. That's right. Did he come to your house? No, he didn't. We flew, we, I flew from New Jersey, I believe. And I met him in Miami and from there he had flown in. I don't know where he flew in from, but from there we, flew right back into uh, into L.A. And there were, all the way from Miami to L.A., there were people, uh, I don't know who they were, uh, assigned to us to watch out and to make sure that he was put on the plane. There was always somebody with us. <laughs> now, when, they, when you say somebody was with you, who are you talking about? I wouldn't know if to call them detectives or policemen, but uh, they were there to make sure that Eric got on the plane and went to L.A., were the Miami police officers? At one point, I believe they were because I remember them putting us in a private room and I would figure they were from Miami. So the way that it um, happened then is, did you arrive at the Miami airport first? No, I probably arrived, I don't know if a day later, a day before, I'm sorry, uh, in the West Palm airport where my mom picked me up. That's the best of my recollection, but to be honest, I don't remember much. So you arrived the day before your cousin arrived at the West Palm Airport? I don't know. I don't know if it was a day before or two days before. I really can't tell you. Well, in any event, you were there before your cousin arrived. That's right. And when your cousin arrived, you met him? That's right. And how much time did you spend with him prior to actually getting onto the plane? An hour, maybe. I don't know. And during that period of time, there were police officers that were making sure that uh, your cousin got on the plane That's right. flight for Los Angeles. My mother was also with us. Did your mother also accompany uh, your cousin and you to Los Angeles? Yes, she did. On that flight? Yes, she did. Did you sit? Did you all sit together? Yes. Was there ever any conversation between you and uh, your cousin on that plane flight uh, to Los Angeles from Florida. Was there any conversation? Yes. I'm sure there was. And what was the nature of that conversation? Just to my calls for here, sir. State, state of mind, right? Well, this is why don't you approach here and we'll discuss it. Mr. Connell, did you and Eric Menendez discuss um, the killing of his parents? Not that I recall, no. Not at all on this plane flight? might have been brought up but uh he didn't tell me that he did it and uh he didn't give me an answer to very much at all when you say he didn't give you an answer did you ask him whether he was involved in the killings of his parents i might have i don't recall you might have asked him that i might have asked him that and uh i don't think he gave me an answer Would you have remembered if he gave you an answer? Overall. I don't know. I don't remember now. Would that have been something important for you to remember? Yes, you it would have. 
would have you would have wanted to know if, if he had been involved in the killing of his parents, I take it. I would have wanted to know. Yes, yeah. I, I would have wanted to know, sure. In fact, um, you believe that he may have been involved, that's why you asked him whether he was involved? To be honest with you, Mr. Kuriyama, I don't even remember asking him. Uh, mostly what I was concerned with was his well-being. Uh, I knew from uh, recent talks with Eric that he was suicidal. And that's what I was worried about. I was worrying about him. And uh, I remember uh, one time on the airplane, he locked himself in the bathroom for about an hour. It seemed to me like an hour. I was waiting and waiting and waiting for him to come out. And I went and knocked because I was very worried about what he might have done in that bathroom. Did you believe at that time that he was having a guilty conscience about killing his parents? I didn't believe anything. I just believed that I was very worried about him. Uh, being worried about him being suicidal, did you uh, suspect that he had been involved in the killings of his parents? I suspected it. Did uh, Eric Menendez indicate to you that uh, he was upset with his father? Objection, that's vague. Time. Sustained. Objection sustained. Do you recall in these conversations that you had in which uh, Eric Menendez expressed that he was suicidal? When did these conversations take place? I don't remember. I, I knew about it. Uh, we, like I said, we were very close. Oh. You can tell that Andy really cares for Eric. I don't, it just, it just it, com it comes across so clearly in his cross examination because of the the way that he's looking back at Kuriyama, the way that he's answering that he's just like, hey man, like, <laughs> like I don't know, <laughs> like what like wh what you're what you're asking for, you know, like it, it, did you did you think that maybe he had a guilty conscience? Uh, you know, he's like. I I thought that I, I cared about my, my cousin and his well being. you know, like it's just, it's, it, he's coming across as like very sincerely to me anyway. That's how it, it strikes me. Other people might, might have a, a difference of opinion, of course, which is always welcome. But I just, for me personally, like when I see this, I, I, I see someone who, who is family and like definitely feels a very strong sense of love and protection for his family. I don't know that that would be to the extent of lying for him, um, but it just it definitely seems he he's he comes across as sincere and and real and and everything. So anyway, yeah, I knew about some of his problems. You're talking about uh, on the flight to Los Angeles. Is that I'm trying to ascertain when it was that uh, these conversations took place, actually. Wait, you're on, it's still big. I don't know what conversations he's talking about. Sustained. Why don't you rephrase the question? Mr. Connell, I believe you testified that uh, you had conversations with uh, your cousin in which he expressed that he was felt suicidal. That's right. When did that occur? I don't remember. This is all about five, six years ago, Ms. Graham. I, uh, I, I couldn't tell you. All I can remember is what I have placed in my mind here. And there were certain things that stuck out in my mind that I do remember very well. And there were others that I just don't know where and how they happened. It also is is very interesting that he every once in a while, you know, names names Mr. Kuriyama, right? That he says, you know, I don't know Mr. Kuriyama. I don't, you know, this or that Mr. Kuriyama. It's it's interesting. It it uh it has it has a similar feel to Johnny Depp saying Mr. Rottenborn. You know, like it just there's something there's something about it that is not necessarily aggressive. But it feels assertive when the witness is using the name of the attorney that is cross-examining them. It 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 speaks a certain level of confidence or something. I don't know. It's it's very it's very it's very interesting. Like he definitely seems like he's like I see you. <laughs> essentially, is is what that what I'm getting at. Can we specify five or six years ago? What date are you referring to? I'm I'm not referring to any date. I'm just referring. It was a long time ago. What time frame, what incident was occurring at that time? I think he's talking about the conversations about uh, suicidal type was of thing. Was that before the flight from Miami to Los Angeles? Or after? Yes, oh, definitely. Before. That was before sometime? It's pretty bad <laughs> when the judge has to take over your cross-examination for you. <laughs> oh, man. Before the, flight from, before the flight from Miami to L.A., yes. Okay, and what is your best memory of when, where and when that occurred? 
maybe a phone call. He might have called me somewhere. I don't know. Uh, when he moved to L.A., I moved to Puerto Rico. I mean, to Puerto Rico, to Florida. So we didn't keep in touch as much, but as much as we could, we would. And uh, I had talked to him several times throughout the years that he was living in L.A. And during the, that period of time, he called you and told you, I feel suicidal? We had some really in-depth conversations. We were very close still, even though we were separated. And in was these before or after uh, the death of uh, Jose? It was before. Was policeman, it was before? It was before. So in these conversations that you had with the defendant, uh, Eric Menendez, before he killed his parents, he told you that he was suicidal, correct? Yes, he did. And you said he got into some in-depth um, discussions about problems he was having. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yes, that would be fair to say. Would he uh, describe for you problems that he was having specifically with his father? I don't remember. I really don't. Like I said, there's certain things that stick out in my head and the others I just don't remember. You have a very good memory of uh, what he told you when you were nine years old? Yes, I do. Yeah, mistakes of testimony. Overall. Is that correct, sir? Uh, I could say I have a good memory of what uh, the subject of the conversation was. I don't know exactly, you know, every step of the way of the conversation. Okay, but let's just try to get to what you do recall. Now, if your cousin had called you in Puerto Rico from Los Angeles and then said, I'm suicidal, would that have been something that got your interest? Well, he called me in Florida, but okay. uh, that would have been something that got my interest, definitely. So that was that would be something that you would recall? Yes. And what do you recall about that, sir? I just remember him telling me. I don't remember where and what phone call. I was in my house in West Palm Beach, most likely. I just know that I know that I knew that he had a lot of problems with himself and with his family and was suicidal. And or he what, felt that he was. <clears throat> what is it that he expressed to you, the nature of the problems? I don't remember. Did you say, well, why are you suicidal? If I did, I don't remember. Would that be a question that would be a logical question to ask of your cousin? Objection on humanity. Sustained. You don't recall asking him any questions? I don't recall. Now, you asked him about these uh, alleged massages, correct? That's right. And you wanted to know in detail what occurred there? Not in detail. He would never give me any details. Uh, we basically were always trying to figure out if what was happening to him was normal. And I had no way of knowing, like I said. And then when he told you later on when he was in Los Angeles uh, about the problems he was having with his uh, parents, you never asked him the nature of those problems? Of which problems? The Sorry. problems that he, when he called you when you were in Florida and he was in Los Angeles, you never said, well, what kind of problems are you having? I don't remember. Don't recall I really that don't. I, don't I, I can't say for sure. When you flew from Florida to Los, Los Angeles, uh, just prior to when uh, your cousin was arrested for the murders of his parents, you had the information from Eric Menendez. He had called you previously from Los Angeles regarding the problems that he was having with his parents, correct? I'm going to object on it. Miss states the witness's testimony. Rephrase the question, please. Okay. You recall that you've, you've testified that uh, Eric Menendez called you in Florida and told you that he was having pro problems with his parents. Objection. That's what Miss states said. He said problems with himself and his family. All right. Rephrase the question. You testified that you got a call from Eric Menendez in Florida that Eric was having problems with his family. Is that right? Objection mistakes the testimony. <laughs> Can you ask a question one more time, Ms. Correa? I'm sorry. So many questions, I'm confused. <laughs> he's trying so hard. Kuriyama is, uh, is he's, he's just trying, he's just trying to get the damn question out. He's getting objected to left and right. The judge is even saying, Nope, you gotta, you gotta ask it in a different way. And then he finally gets it out without objections. And then he's like, I'm sorry. Can you ask that one more time? <laughs> Good on Andy. Good on Andy. Make sure as a witness, you've got to make sure that you absolutely understand the question before you answer it. Now you've testified that when Eric Menendez moved to Los Angeles, 
he would call you periodically when you're in Florida, correct? He did call me periodically. And on at least one of those occasions, he told you that he was suicidal, correct? Yes, I believe that's how I knew it. And on at least one occasion, he told you that he was having problems with his family. Is that right? Yes, it is. And it's your testimony that you never asked and you don't know what the nature of those problems were? I don't remember. Uh, we, we would talk pretty in-depthly about a lot of things, and there was a lot of problems in my life that I would talk to him about as well. So I was pretty distracted, you know, if I would talk to him. Were you having problems with your family as well? Uh, the, Who doesn't? I don't remember. I'm sure there's, I've always had problems. Everybody. I mean, yeah. Like who, who hasn't had family problems at some point, even if you have the best family in the world and everyone is amazing, there's zero toxicity at all. Everybody's super healthy. Everybody's got some kind of personality problems within their family at some point. If you don't, there are other problems that are just not being spoken about. <laughs> Everybody always has problems, so. Thank you. Then I would talk to him about what was on my mind. Would you discuss? Were, were you ever suicidal? No. Or, I'm going to eject this one. It's gotten pretty far afield. Yeah. yeah. Wait a second. Oh my God! I want to hear what he said. What he said under his breath just now. Everybody always has problems, so. Then I would talk to him about what was on my mind. Would you discuss, were, were you ever suicidal? No. Or, I'm going to eject this one. It's gotten pretty far afield. I didn't hear what he said, but it's, I mean, that definitely was, uh, uh, that was not, not a relevant question, not relevant information. That definitely was Kuriyama getting frustrated and hitting below the belt. And look at that look right now. He did not like that question at all. On this Just train ride from Florida to Los Angeles, that you had indicated. Oh, is that what is that what it was? Such a scumbag. Could be. Do you guys mind? I'm gonna, or what, is it what is going on? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back one more time. I hope I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I'm annoying people, but I just I wanna I wanna try to listen for it. testimony that you never asked and you don't know what the nature of those problems were? I don't remember. Uh, we would talk pretty in-depthly about a lot of things and there was a lot of problems in my life that I would talk to him about as well. So I was pretty distracted, you know, if I would talk to him. Were you having problems with your family as well? Uh, the, we went back a little bit further. I don't remember. I'm sure there's, I've always had problems. So accurate. Everybody always has problems, so. That I would talk to him about what was on my mind. Would you discuss, were, were you ever suicidal? No. Or, I'm going to eject this one. It's gotten pretty far afield. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. I'm not, I, I still can't. Yeah, I'm not sure that I heard such a scumbag. I'm not sure that I heard like what is going on. Like it definitely seemed like what is something. But I don't, other than that, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that was... Okay, so you hear scumbag? Fo folks hear that. Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay, all right. I mean, <laughs> I can believe that. I can believe that. And if I was the the jury and I and I heard him and I heard him say what a scumbag, I wouldn't um I wouldn't even like, "Oh, is this guy for real?" That may that may have been it. Okay, sorry. I'm going to do it one more time and listen for that. Okay, so I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I just is this guy for real? That may that may have been it. Let's see here. Were you having problems with your family as well? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember. I'm sure there's. I've always had problems. Mm -hmm. Everybody always has problems. So, I would talk to him about what was on my mind. Would you discuss? Were, were you ever suicidal? No. Or, I'm going to eject this one. It's gotten pretty far afield. Suspicious. Okay, we're going to move on. On this plane ride from Florida to Los Angeles, uh, you had indicated that uh, you suspected that uh, your cousin had been involved in the killings of his parents, correct? That's right. And you made a comment to him. Uh, would you describe uh, for the jury how your cousin reacted to your question? 
yeah, about whether he was involved. Be more specific again, counsel. Just state your legal objection. Be more specific as to what you mean, Mr. Creon. Okay. Do you recall, uh, Mr. Connell, uh, Eric Menendez's reaction to your inquiry as to whether he was involved in the killing of his parents? I don't recall, Ms. Graham. I don't recall anything about that plane ride. I was very emotional, and so was he. You were thinking enough to ask him whether or not he was involved in the killings, so, though. Right? argumentative and mistakes the witness's testimony. Overall. Is that right, sir? I'm sorry. You were you were thinking and clear headed enough to ask your cousin whether he was involved in the killings. I don't remember. Now, what did your your mother in your presence ever ask uh, Eric Menendez whether he was involved in the killings of his parents? If she did. Just then the answer is true. During the period of time when you returned with Eric uh, Menendez back to Los Angeles, uh, you took the plane ride from Florida to Los Angeles, and what is that, like a five-hour flight? Yes. And then you touched down in, at LAX, correct? As far as I can remember, I, I don't think it was a connecting flight. I really doubt it, but I definitely touched down at LAX if that's where we landed. I think so. When you arrived at LAX, were there any instructions given to you by your cousin? None. None? And have you visited your cousin in jail? I have. And you visited him with your mother? Yes. Um, about how many times? Ooh. That's hard to say. As, as best I can remember, maybe four times I visited him. Four or five, I don't know. Somewhere around that number. <coughs> And did you ever discuss the, the pending case that he had in this matter? No. It was uh, very brief when I ever got to see him. It was only 20 minutes, you know, and I would have to split that time with my mother. My main concern was how he was doing. During these visits, did he ever tell you that he indeed was the killer of his parents with his brother? No, he didn't tell me that. He never told you that? No. I have nothing further this time, Your Honor. Anyway, you're right. <laughs> Mr. Connor, was it significant to you when you were a kid, when you were 10 or 11, that your cousin Eric had sworn you to secrecy about something? Yes, it was. Is that like something boys do, you know, blood brothers and swearing secrecy? Sort of like a pinky promise. Sort of like a pinky promise. And did Eric make this the real, the strongest pinky promise you ever had to make? It wasn't a pinky promise, but uh, it was definitely very intense. And I would have never told anybody. Was your friendship with Eric when you were a little guy special to you? When yes, you were a little guy. Now, do you remember a time? When you were living in Florida, when you were contemplating, thinking about moving to Puerto Rico to live with your dad. Yes. Oh. Stay. I will tie it up, Your Honor, if I can. Okay. Do you remember receiving a call from Eric about that time when you were thinking about moving to Puerto Rico? Actually, beyond scope. Overall. Yes, I remember a call around that. And time. do you remember in that phone call, Eric telling you then that he was very upset, suicidal, and wanted to come live with you in Florida? I don't remember the exact nature of the conversation, but I remember in that conversation, he did tell me that he wanted to come live with, in, with me in Florida uh, because he was having problems at home. Okay. And do you recall what your response to him was? Yes. I, what, uh, what was it? Okay. I, I told him that at that point I was thinking of moving to Puerto Rico, but that if I didn't know whether my father would mind if he would have wanted to come down there with me. Now, did you wind up moving to Puerto Rico? Yes, I did. Overall. 
Yes, I did. Now, do you recall after um, your aunt and uncle were killed, uh, did you see Eric back east? After my aunt and uncle were killed? Yes. I saw him at the funeral. Okay. And did you see him even after the week of the funeral on other trips he made back east before he was arrested? Yeah, I'm, I saw him several times. You had sisters who still live in the New Jer in the Princeton area? Yes, that's true. And were you in the Princeton area after, apart from the attending the memorial service or the funeral, were you in the Princeton area um, in 1989 in the fall? Yes, I, uh, I attended the Hunt School of Princeton, which is in Princeton, New Jersey. So you were actually living there then? That's right. And did you see your cousin Eric on visits he made there? Yes, I did. I don't recall that he made too many, but uh, or at least I didn't see him too many times. But the times I did, I'd spend a little bit of time with him. Okay. Now, you said that when you were on the airplane with him, you were concerned about him because you knew that he had felt suicidal in the past. That's right. And does that relate only to the distant past before his parents died? Or did you have any information about his feeling suicidal after they died? Well, that feeling that I had began before they died. And had you received any information after they died that led you to believe that he was feeling suicidal? Well, knowing Eric as a friend, I knew that... Uh, that was definitely possible and going through whatever he went through was hard enough for him that I thought that maybe he would. Now you said that the plane ride here from Florida was very emotional. Were you aware at that time that your cousin Lyle Menendez was in jail? Yes. And was it your expectation that as soon as Eric got to Los Angeles, he too would be locked up? Yes. And based on anything that was said, was that Eric's understanding? He was going back to go to jail. That's right. <coughs> he knew that very well. When Eric was a teenager, did he uh, strike that? After Eric moved to California, did he ever bring up the molestation by his father to you again? No. Did you ever broach the subject again? No. That's really interesting because of the the letter that was that was later found, because that that was t timing wise, that letter happened. I think. Well, it, I'm pretty sure that letter ha happened. Or, sorry, how am I talking? Eric wrote that letter when he was living in California and he was talking about how he said, you know, the abuse or the the stuff that I told you about, it's happening again. And it's worse this time. Um, that's at least my understanding. I can't remember. I think the the letter is available to be read. And if so, I definitely read it. I just can't remember the details at the moment, but I'm pretty sure I remember it being like it was from California. So that, that is interesting. When he would make reference to problems in the family, was he ever specific about what was going on at, that you can recall? No. Uh, I don't recall any details. He would just say something like, things with my parents are going really badly. Something to that effect. Did you know that there was talk of potential divorce in that family in 1986 and 1987? I really didn't know much about his family. They're very private people. From what you had observed being around them over the years, did, did you think that it would be difficult for a kid to be in that family? Interesting. How did you think it would be to be a child of that family based on what you saw? I definitely. Objection system. 
Did you have any difficulty in understanding Eric when he said he had problems with those parents? No, I didn't. Did you think they were problem parents? Objection calls for public opinion. Sustained. Did you think that you would have problems living with your Uncle Jose and your Aunt Kitty? Irrelevant. Sustained. Yeah. When Eric would tell you that he was having problems, did you ask him to elaborate? If I did, I don't recall. I'm sure I must have at some point. Did you ever envy him or wish you could live in his fit with his family? No. Sustained. It's relevant. Sure. Yeah. Just trying to get there. You said that the family was very private. Yes, I did. The objection is sustained. The answer is true. He's already testified to it without objection. Well, right? just because of that doesn't open up the area. Objection sustained. During the flight from Miami, you said your mother was sitting next to you? Yes, she was. Did she appear to be concerned with Eric's well-being? Definitely. Now, you said that I was the first person that you relayed the conversations about the molestation to. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And do you remember when it was that you first told me? I don't remember the date, no. Do you remember the month and the year? Uh, no, I don't. January 9th. <laughs> She's trying to supply him with the answer. Question, yeah. Excuse me? What was your question? The question was, would January 1991 refresh your recollection? I told you that's when I first that's, met you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and as of January 1991, were you under 18? Yes, I was. I mean, she definitely is leading. 100% is leading here. I'm, I'm surprised that they're not continuing to object because she, she is totally leading him in this moment. And when you were under 18, uh, were you prohibited from visiting your cousin in the county jail? That is true. And uh, did you ever well, strike that? Did you visit him then before you told me or only after you told me? Only after I told you. So the reason for asking that is essentially to to suggest to the jury well were you coached to supply this information like was this was this something that was concocted you know that that he he t he told you know you guys together conspired during one of the times when you were visiting him in the in in jail no he wasn't allowed to to visit him the last time he saw him but until he turned 18 was was on that plane ride presumably because he was arrested right afterwards I have nothing further. Any further cross? It'll be okay if I get some more wine. Sure, we'll get it for you. Thanks. Mr. Oh, thanks. Before uh, January 1991, Cousin had been in jail for about eight months. Right? Yes, that's right. You flew back uh, from Florida about March of 1990. I f I flew in with him. That was uh, the only time that I can remember. And did you have any uh, discussions with any relatives about the nature of the defense in this case? Objection on a personal thing at the time. Objection sustained. Did you did you get any calls first of all from Eric Menendez uh, after he was incarcerated in Los Angeles County Jail? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't remember any, so no. Have you ever had any conversations with him um, after he was incarcerated? How about phone calls? Yes. I believe I might have talked to him a couple times. Uh, maybe. Uh, I don't remember where. I don't know. Okay. So, 
in these that, so that could introduce the opportunity for for Eric and and Andy to to talk about this if it was over the phone. Granted, that phone call probably would have been recorded by the prison system or you know by by the by the by the county jail. So, I mean, after all, <laughs> that's how Donna Adelson is is uh is currently being being charged for for conspiring to murder her son in law, right? These conversations after your cousin was incarcerated in the Los Angeles County Jail. Uh, what were the nature of the, what was the nature of those conversations? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. No foundation. Well, it's Admission. vague as to which conversations you're referring to, Counsel. Okay. Why don't you describe? You're referring to conversations between the defendant and the witness. Yes. At and the county yeah. jail. No, uh, over the phone when after uh, the defendant was incarcerated in the county jail. Right, well, so, so that we know what I, you're talking about. I'm sorry. You understand that after your cousin was incarcerated in the county jail in March of 1990, uh, he called you on the phone. Is that correct? Objection on vague as to time. Objection to the question. Did uh, he ever call you after he was arrested? Yes, he called me. And where did you receive those phone calls? I think I talked to him once in my house, in or my mother's house in West Palm Beach. And um, do you recall staying for a time in Los Angeles after your cousin was arrested? That is, when you came on the uh, flight from, from Miami to Los Angeles, did you immediately turn around and go back to Miami? I might have stayed a couple days. I don't remember. Now, did you have any conversations? Um, well, where were you staying after you arrived in Los Angeles, <clears throat> after the defendant was arrested? After he was arrested? Yes. I believe I was staying in the Beverly Hills home. Okay. So during that period of time that when you were there at the Beverly Hills home, did you receive any calls from the defendant? I didn't know. You don't know? No, I did not. You did not? No. Was there anyone else with you at that house during that period of time? My grandmother and my mother. believe. Now, think back on this uh, call that you got from the defendant at your home in Florida. Uh -huh. What what was said by the defendant in that conversation? Absolutely. Overall. I don't remember the nature of the conversation. Uh, I was mainly concerned with how he was doing and how he was spending the time. Had you at that point heard the evidence against him? That is, had you read any articles about the case? I don't think I'd read any articles. I might have watched the news. So after watching the news, uh, did you also have discussions with uh, relatives about the case? No. no. I never ever discussed anything really with relatives. It wasn't something we wanted to bring up. Did you ever talk to your mother about this case? No. Never? I've talked to her about, you know, friends or other things that might have happened, but never about the context of the case. Okay, let's just get this straight. You, you've talked about friends and other things, but you've never talked about this case with your mother over the past four years? Well, I'm sure I've talked to her several times, but not about the defense, if that's what you're implying. You never talk. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding you, Ms. Graham. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to object to my questioning at ABM, so be calm and figure here, sir. Well, it's unfocused, so let's okay. see if we can pinpoint it a little bit. Mr. It is Graham, unfocused. Thank you, Your Honor. Objection sustained. <laughs> Mr. Connell, is it your testimony that from the time that Eric Menendez was arrested in March of 1990 to today, as you sit there on the witness stand, that you've not talked to your mother about this case? I'm sure I have. And what have you talked to her about? I don't Objection remember. Objection on a cost of hearsay. Sustained. I don't remember. What? I never don't revealed answer. it. Wait, don't wait, answer. Just wait for another question. Sorry. Objection was sustained. He just really wanted to say. <laughs> have you, this goes to your state of mind, have you gotten information about the nature of this case? Objection. Over the past. Vague. Over the past uh, four years. I'm going to object to that. It's irrelevant. Sustained. And irrelevant. Mr. Connell, the only conversations that you 
really remember are the ones that you had with your cousin about these alleged massages. Would that be fair to say? Those are the ones that stick out in my head, yes. You don't remember anything about the uh, suicide calls or anything after the defendant called you after he was arrested? You don't remember the nature of any of those calls? Objection, it's compounded on demand. It's been asked and answered. Okay. Nothing further, though. Oh. All right, anything else? No. All right, you may step down. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you. We'll be in recess until tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Please don't discuss this matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about right it. Now. We'll resume tomorrow at 9 o'clock. I'll ask that counsel, counsel, I'll order that you be here at 845 with your next witness. So, okay. Uh, David Mrovich. Okay, so we're going to, but really quick, we're, we're, we're still going to watch it. We're not done yet. But I just wanted to, I just want, I just, I, we, we need, we need a little bit of a palate cleanser, right? Look at that. Look at that pup. <laughs> she is very relaxed right now. <laughs> I promise you guys she's alive. Andy Bear. Hey, puppy, puppy. See, she kind of looked over. All right. Anyway. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I, I couldn't resist. I had to. All righty, let's continue on. This is the last witness for the day. All right. M R A O V I T C H. Mr. Mravich, am I saying your name correctly? Close enough. Okay. What? Uh, how old are you? Twenty-two. And do you go to school? Yes. Where do you go to school? Uh, I go to University of Pennsylvania. What do you study? Philosophy and psychology. And do you know Eric Menendez, who's sitting in court in a turquoise sweater? Yes. When did you first meet Eric Menendez? Uh, in eighth grade. And where were you, what school were you attending in the eighth grade? Uh, Princeton Day School. And was Eric also attending Princeton Day School when you met him? Yes. Was he in the same grade as you or a different grade? Same grade. What year was it, if you recall, uh, that you first met Eric? Um, what, what year was eighth grade? Yes. I guess 85, 84. Okay. Uh, in the eighth grade, you would have been about 14? Yeah. Is, yes. that, right? Is that yes? Yes. Did you also know Eric Menendez in uh, the ninth grade? Yes. And uh, were you still attending PDS in the ninth grade? Yes. Were you friends with Eric Menendez? Yes. Now, Mr. Moravich, I'm going to direct your attention to an incident that occurred uh, in the ninth grade when you went to the Department of Motor Vehicles with Eric and his mother. Do you have that incident in mind? Yes. And do you remember what time it was during the school year that you went to the Department of Motor Vehicles with Eric and his mother? Yes. What time was it? Uh, spring. And w was there a particular reason why uh, you went to the Department of Motor Vehicles at that time? Yes. And what was that reason? <clears throat> Eric was getting his moped license. Now, in uh, New Jersey, uh, is it your understanding that... Uh, Youngsters under the age of 16 are allowed to get a license to drive a moped. Yes. When you uh, went to the Department of Motor Vehicles, did Eric have to take some sort of a test? Yes. And did you observe him take that test? Yes. What kind of a test did you see him take? He had to ride his moped around a track and uh, he had to perform certain activities. He had to stop and make a signal <coughs> and uh, do whatever the guy said. Okay. Was there, there was a man who was administering this test? Yes. And when you watched Eric take this test, uh, was his mother present? Yes. And did she uh, also appear to be watching him take the test? Yes. How long did the test take? It took about 15 minutes. Okay. And after the test, uh, did someone come over to inform Mrs. Menendez of whether Eric, uh, Eric Menendez passed or failed? 
Yes. Who came over to give the, her that information? The uh, DMV person. And did uh, Eric, did he tell her that Eric passed the test or failed he the test? He told her that he failed the test. And did he tell her why he failed the test? Yes. Why did he say he failed the he test? He said that uh, Eric put his foot down when he was, uh, wasn't supposed to. Okay, now, how did Mrs. Menendez react to receiving this news that Eric hadn't passed the test? She was very, she was very angry. She got very upset. What, uh, wh what did she do? Describe what you saw, please. She, uh, she started yelling at the, at the DMV person and said that, uh, that Eric did everything correctly and that uh, there was no reason why he, should, he shouldn't have passed. Okay. Uh, when you say yelling, are you telling us that she raised her voice? She was getting very upset and practically screaming at the guy. Was this in Eric's presence? Uh, no. Okay. Right. And how long did this go on? For about uh, five minutes. Now, you said that Mrs. Menendez had uh, told the DMV person that Eric had done everything correctly and shouldn't have failed the test? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moravich, had you watched Eric take this particular test? Yes. And uh, did you see whether or not Eric had put his foot on the ground as the DMV man described? Yes, I saw it. And did he put his foot on yes, the ground? Yes, he did. So what was Mrs. Menendez then um, not telling the truth to the DMV man that she was screaming at? Objection calls for speculation. Like the foundation. Did Mrs. Menendez... Um, did her comments to the DMV man, were those con inconsistent with what you knew to have happened? Objection calls for speculation. Did the incident at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles involving Mrs. Menendez and Eric make an impression on you? Objection irrelevant. Is there a particular reason why you remember that incident now? Yes. Irrelevant. That answer will stand. Yeah. And what is the reason why you remember that incident now? I don't know why the sound is out. I'm going to ask that uh, you direct your attention to November of 1989. Uh, where were you living then? Um, in November of 89, I was yes. living at uh, Brandeis University campus. Okay. And were you going to school at Brandeis University? Yes. Uh, what year were you in at Brandeis? It was my freshman year. Uh, did you at some point in November of 1989 receive a phone call from Eric Menendez? Yes. Okay, and during uh, a, a particular phone call in November of 1989, did Eric extend an invitation to you? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay, where, what, what, what did he say? He where asked, did he invite you? He invited me to Cancun. Okay, and where's Cancun? In uh, Mexico. And when he invited you to go to Cancun, was that a, a convenient time for you to leave school? No. Why not? Um, I had classes. It meant uh, cutting classes. Uh, did you agree to go to Cancun with Eric? Yes. And why was it that you agreed to paid uh, for it? leave school at that time and go to Cancun with Eric? Because um, Eric said that he, that, he, that he needed a friend to talk to. And that was why he had asked you to join him? Yes. Okay. How did you get to Cancun? I took a plane. And was this a ticket that you bought yourself? <clears throat> no. Who paid for the ticket? Eric did. Now, how long were you in Cancun? For a week. And during the week that you were in Cancun, 
Uh, did Eric talk with you regarding a therapist? Yes. Uh, that he was seeing. Yes. <clears throat> and what uh, did he tell you about the therapist that he was seeing? He said that um, he was seeing a therapist and that uh, somebody had chosen this therapist for him. Let me stop you. Did he say who had chosen the therapist for him? No. Sorry. My... Uh... Earbuds just died on me. I think, did they both die? One of them did. This one should be okay, though. No? No. This one's dead, too. Okay. Gonna listen on general audio. There's not too much left in here. We've got like uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes left. So let me know if there's an echo. There shouldn't be. But he told you that this wasn't someone that, that he had uh, decided upon or chose himself. Is that correct? Can you, can you repeat the question? He told you that this therapist was not someone that he had uh, chosen or decided upon himself. Yes. And what, what else did he say about the therapist that, that was chosen for him? He said that um, he was trying to tell the therapist uh, things to make him feel better, but that uh, the therapist was more interested in his financial affairs <laughs> than he was in making him feel better. And when uh, Eric talked about making him feel better, did you understand that to mean making him feel better about the deaths of his parents? Yes. During the time that you uh, saw Eric in Cancun, um, how would you describe describe his emotional state? Yeah, when I when I first got down there, he was he was he seemed pretty upset. He seemed uh, kind of out of it, and uh, just needed uh, needed to to talk to somebody who he felt he could trust. And. Uh, did he appear to trust you? Yes. Did he tell you that? Yes. Now, you said that when you first arrived, Eric was upset and out of it. Did his mood change during the trip? Yeah, he got, he got better. Um, when you say he got better, what do you mean? I mean, um, I was, I was trying to cheer him up and, uh, I think it worked. Okay. Was there any change in Eric's mood towards the end of the trip uh, when he was about to go back to Los Angeles and you were about to go back to Brandeis? Yeah, he's, he seemed wary of going home. He, he, uh, I'm sorry. He seemed can... wary of going home. When you say wary, what do you mean? He, uh, he seemed, like, seemed like he knew he had to deal with a lot of pressure. A lot of uh, unusual circumstances. When did he say or do anything that made you think he was wary of going home? Well, he, he told me that uh, he had a lot of pressure to deal with when he got home. Okay. Now, Did he say an, anything else during the visit about the therapist and uh, his feelings about him? Yes. And what did he say? He said he didn't trust him. Did he explain why he didn't trust the therapist? He said that the therapist um, was uh, only interested in, or was, was, was primarily interested in, in his uh, financial affairs and what he was doing with his money and not with uh, helping him. And did Eric indicate to you at that point in time that he needed help? Uh, yeah. <coughs> yes. Yes. In fact, that was your understanding of the reason why you were 
invited to go to Cancun. Yes, exactly. May I just have a moment, Your Honor? Returning for a minute to the DMV incident uh, with Mrs. Menendez, what was the behavior that you saw her uh, engaging in at that time unusual behavior for her? Direction policy regulation. Sustained one question. Okay. H had you uh, seen Mrs. Menendez during the uh, two years that you were friends with Eric in eighth and ninth grade? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> About how many times? About six or seven times. Okay. And uh, during the six or seven times that you saw her, were you able to observe the way she reacted with her son and other people? Yes. Okay. And uh, was the incident at the DMV, was that unusual behavior uh, in your experience with her? Or, or was that normal? It was very unusual. Okay. So it stuck out in your mind? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Right, <clears throat> Mr. Moravich, is that close enough? Close enough. Okay. Uh, the behavior that you saw Mrs. Menendez display at the DMV, you said it was unusual. Yes. Okay. How was? How did she normally behave towards you? She didn't really behave towards me at all. <laughs> she. Um, it's interesting. She was most of the time she acted like she didn't even notice I was there. Was she ever cruel to you while you were at the Menendez home? No. Did she ever, was she ever mean to you or did she ever strike you or anything? Oh my God, no. literally. Okay. Uh, but on this particular day, you remember her behavior because- I was, I was, I was, jo I was joking, but Pam went there. She, she basically wants to ask every single witness if Kitty hit them. <laughs> because she was angry with the man at the DMV, is that correct? That's correct. And I believe you indicated that you actually saw um, Eric Menendez put his foot down, which was what the DMV man was complaining about, correct? Yes. Did you see him do anything else wrong while he was taking his moped test? No. Now, um, this trip to Cancun um, came at an inconvenient time for you because you were in your first semester of your freshman year, correct? Yes. And do you remember what part of November it was that you went to Cancun? Was it the beginning, the middle, or the end? I believe it was the beginning. Do you remember approximately when? Do you, like what day? Uh, what day of the week? Sure, that would be helpful. Um, I think it was a Sunday or a Monday that I left. I think I got back the next weekend, Saturday. All right, so you were there about six or seven nights. I'm sorry, say that again. You left on a, what, a Sunday or Monday and you got back the following? Following Friday or Saturday. All right, so you were there five or six nights. Yes. All right. Now, um, during this period of time, did Eric Menendez ever talk to you about the night that his parents were killed? Yes. And what did he tell you about the night that his parents were killed? Uh, can you repeat the question? What did Eric Menendez tell you while you were in Cancun about the night that his parents were killed in August of 1989? He said that uh, he saw his parents dead. Did he ever indicate to you during your trip in Cancun that he had been responsible for the death of his parents? No. Did he ever in any way indicate to you that he wanted to tell you something about his participation in the killing of his parents? I, I don't recall. Do you, do you recall during um, your trip in Cancun feeling suspicious that perhaps he was involved? Objection uh, Mr. Moravich, um, I believe you indicated that Eric Menendez got you to go to, on the Cancun trip because he really needed someone to talk to, someone he could trust. Is that correct? Yes. And that during the time that you were there, he indicated you, to you that he'd been talking to a therapist who he didn't trust. Correct? Correct. Did he tell you that he confessed his participation in the killings of his parents to this therapist? No. Did he tell you that his brother had threatened the therapist? No. Did he tell you that the therapist had made some tapes to protect himself from 
the Menendez brothers? No. Okay. So during the time that you were with him in Cancun, did he portray himself as someone who had merely found his parents' dead bodies the night of August the 20th? Objection, Overall. He, he didn't portray himself in any particular way. Uh, in fact, we, I, I tried to avoid the subject of his parents' death because uh, I was trying to make him feel better. Right, but d during the course of your week or your five or six nights in Cancun, he did talk to you about that night, didn't he, did he not? Um, yes, but very briefly. And, and what did he tell you? That he come home and found his parents dead, is that correct? He told me that he saw his parents dead. Right, and he didn't give you any other information about what he'd done that night, is that correct? That's correct. And by telling you that he found his parents dead, did he lead, lead you to believe that he was not involved in their killings? Objection, this states the testimony of Pastor Stephanie. Sir, um, on August the 21st of 1989, <clears throat> the day after uh, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez were killed, did you talk to Eric Menendez on the phone? Objection, Your Honor, beyond the scope, and I'd ask you a question. Sir, during the time that you were with Eric Menendez in Cancun, did he ever talk to you about how he felt about his father? No. Did he ever talk to you about any problems he'd been having with his, pro his father prior to his father's death? Uh, in Cancun? Yes. No. Did he ever talk to you about how he felt about his mother during the trip in Cancun? Objection. Uh, yes. And what did he tell you about his mother? This is that exhale earlier was just he he definitely was very much like, oh, what am I, what am I, what what have I got myself into? What am I doing here? <laughs> I mean, he definitely seems like he's just so uncomfortable and just like, oh God, I just want to get through this. He said he, he said he was very upset about his mother. Now, I believe you indicated that one of the reasons that you left your first semester at school and went to join Eric Menendez is because he indicated to you that he really needed someone to talk to, correct? Yes. And he needed someone he could trust? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Did he ever tell you that um, between the ages of 6 and 18, his father had been sexually abusing him? No. And he never told you during that trip that he had participated in the killings of his parents, did he? Yes. He never told you that, did he? No. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Any regrets? <coughs> Mr. Maravich, did uh, Eric in Cancun tell you that he was uh, very upset about his mother's death? Yes. And did he, in fact, uh, talk about his mother in Cancun as if she was still alive, using the present tense? Yes. That's interesting. Thank you. I have nothing further. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Is that it? Is that everything? Mr. Moravich, uh, returning okay. for a moment to the conversations about the therapist, was there any particular thing that you remember that the therapist was trying to do uh, that was making Eric uh, not trust him? Eric can call it did Eric tell you about any particular thing the therapist Patrick, was me, not me. Uh, doing uh, that made Eric not trust him? Yes. And, and what was it that he told you? He said that uh, he wanted to know what he was doing with his money and uh, how he was planning to use it. Uh, did... Uh, what Eric told you, well, did it appear that the therapist was inappropriately involved in Eric's financial affairs? Did Eric tell you that he felt the therapist's uh, desires to be involved in his financial affairs made him feel any certain way? He 
he asked me what what I thought of it. He he didn't know what to make of it. And that was again one of the reasons why Eric didn't trust the therapist. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Okay. Anything else? Right, thank you. Excuse. And that's the end. Okay. That is the end of today. <laughs> We've got Mavi and Indy that are maybe posturing a little bit with each other. <laughs> um, anyhow, that's the end of today. That was a lot of testimony. This was definitely a longer episode, but it was very, very interesting to get through all of this testimony that we did today. So thank you so much for joining me. This was fascinating. Uh, finally, I've, he I've heard so much about Andy Cano's testimony. It was great to finally, finally see it for ourselves. And uh, yeah, so we've got a uh, members only live stream on Friday. So uh, if you guys are our members, be sure to join us for that casual Friday members only live stream. Uh, we'll have another, another Menendez Monday episode. We'll be back to Mondays again next week. Uh, and in between, we're going to have some, some more, some more content coming out. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. And hey, puppers. Uh, I think that for me about does it. So thank you so much for joining me. And I hope you have a whoop. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday, whatever is left of it, and the rest of your week either way. So thank you so much. And I'll see you guys in the next video.